Hello, everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown. And today, oh my goodness, we're going to talk about Lori Vallow. What's her name again? <laughs> Against Lori Vallow Day Bell. I mean, she, she actually is Lori Fox Vallow Day Bell. If you added all the other husbands in, her, her name would be like this one. Uh, and Chad Day Bell, her last husband, uh, the both of them are now uh, awaiting their trial coming up, I think, in the beginning of uh, 2023. So this is such an incredibly, incredibly bizarre case. People have been asking me to talk about this case for at least a year now, and I put it off and put it off because I wanted to see where this was going legally. And now, since the trial is coming up, I feel pretty confident to comment on this. And also, I've been interested in... Uh, a lot of the ways people are thinking about how this could have happened, what kind of minds will be involved in doing the things that were done. Um, and so I'm going to get into all of that. But first, I want to welcome everybody who is in the chat room. And it is a big chat room today. Uh, I, I might miss your names as to who is here so far. Lisa N is here. Ms. Leah is here. Carolina is here. Lisa S is here. Robin's here. Uh, Aisha's here. Um, did I say that right today, Aisha? I know you told me last time how to pronounce it, Aisha. Um, uh, Molly's here. Uh, I think Lisa N and Lisa S. Florence is here. Uh, oh, my goodness. David is here. Uh, Martin is here. Let's see who else is in here. Um, Anna is here. I know I'm missing somebody. Molly is here. And Molly, uh, I asked Molly to stay around to the end because she sent me something before the show. And I'm going to talk about that right at the end of the show because I think it's really important. Nancy's here. Um, and I'm sure I've missed somebody and I feel bad if I did, but sorry guys, if I did anyway, um, so we have a chat room here. Uh, and if you would like to be in this chat room, uh, please do join Patreon, um, over here, five bucks a month. Uh, all my chat rooms are available to my Patreon people. This keeps our chat rooms to have a wonderful community of truly interested people, not a whole bunch of bots and haters. Um, and, uh, so we have a great community via Patreon and also supports the channel. And also just please just like and subscribe. That helps tremendously and hit the bell for notifications. And I want to remind you because people forget this. They ask me about cases and I say, check my playlist because I've probably done that case already. And uh, the other easy way to do it is just put in the name of the person or the case you're interested in and then put in profiler Pat Brown or profiling with Pat Brown and put that in the search engine of YouTube and boom, you'll see if I've done it or not. Uh, that makes it easy. I also have book, books for sale below, um, which are, this is a great psychological mystery, which is a lot of fun and just $2.99, supports the channel, or I can hit that little dollar sign. Okay, that's all my all my speeches for that. Let's get to the program. All right, so, oh my goodness. Um, let me tell you first where I got my information. Um, because I think that's important. Sometimes I see people do shows and, you know, I, I kind of want to know where they found the stuff that they found um, because it can influence how we think. And, and if you think that I missed something, I should have listened to something else. I should have read something else or accessed something else. Uh, you know, you may have some questions about what I say as well. I'm not exempt from that. I try to try to get enough information to be able to make a proper analysis. Um, I, I don't sometimes do a, like watch some podcast, which is 10 hours long because somebody says it's a great podcast, maybe because I'm not that thrilled with those kind of podcasts, but I try to access enough information that's useful. So for this, because Netflix just put out this show, just put out this show. And if you're uh, coming to the channel to this show and you haven't seen the Netflix documentary and you'd like to see it before you listen to me, I do recommend you just hit stop, um, watch the documentary and come back to this show later. Um, so let me tell you what this, this show is called. It is Sins of Our Mother and uh, that just came out. And uh, it's not that long. So it's it's it was, uh, and I thought it was pretty well done because the family was speaking, especially the son you see there, Colby, poor guy. Um, I think is one of the, ni the nice ones in the family who isn't messed up. Um, and then there's other people who chime in and it's very, very interesting show about what they live through, what they experience. It's really quite, quite good. I'd recommend it highly. Um, then 
so I had more background information because I really wanted to know about Lori's childhood and what happened. And they didn't go into that much in the um, in the the documentary. So I read this book. It's called The Doomsday Mother. Um, and it took me, I'd say, a good three hours to get through this book. And I have some quotes from this book in the show. Uh, and I think it it filled in a lot of blanks for me. So I thought that was really important. Um, so that's what I looked at. And of course, other stuff on the internet. And before I go into my thoughts on all of this, let me just give you the Wikipedia, the short Wikipedia version of what happened, because some of you may come here and go, I've never heard of this case. And let me tell you, this case is so complicated. It goes over so many years and so many different things happen and people dying here and there and everywhere <laughs> connected with her, of course, um, that it, I, it would take me 10 different shows to do. So I'm going to give you the short version and then I'm going to go into the important points that help me helped me understand her. And I hope will help you understand why this why this happened, or at least my my belief as to why this happened. And you can disagree with it, but at least you'll have my particular analysis of it. Okay, so uh, the, um, in Wikipedia, it's it is listed as the killings of Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. These are two of her children. All right, uh, Tylee and Joshua Vallow, uh, Tylee Ryan and Joshua Vallow called JJ, um, were two American children from Chandler, Arizona, who disappeared in September of 2019. This is a fairly recent case. Uh, and they were found dead June 2020 in Rexburg, Idaho. Tylee was last seen alive at Yellowstone National Park on September 8th. And uh, I actually have a picture of that. Let me see if I can find a picture of when they were alive. I have... You have to be a little patient because I have I took so many pictures here that it gets confusing. Okay, there she is. Uh, she's at Yellowstone. Uh, she's with her little brother, and this is Alex. The um, this is Lori's brother, Alex, and Alex plays a huge part in this, <clears throat> really huge part in this whole this whole this whole show of what went down. All right, her younger the her younger brother JJ was last seen alive in September of. 23rd of 2019 at an elementary school. He was initially reported missing by relatives. Those were his uh, um, grand grandparents. I, I, so many people on this thing. Uh, uh, that little boy was, um, it was, he was born to a drug addicted mother. He has autism. Um, and the grand, I believe it was the grandparents. They, they took care of him for a while, but then when she married, their son. <laughs> I say I get confused at who's who. Maybe it's there's so many players. I'll get. I'll try to straighten it all out later. They they adopted him. She and her husband, her fourth husband, adopted the little boy JJ. And and uh, so uh, she at that point was his mother, JJ's mother. Although she did not birth JJ. Tylee, she did birth. That was her birth daughter. All right. Now. He was initially reported missing by relatives concerned about not only the children from whom they had not heard in weeks, but also several other suspicious incidents. In November of 2019, police questioned the children's mother, Lori Val Vallow Daybell, about the children's whereabouts and welfare. Lori and her new husband, Chad Guy Daybell, okay, this was Chad's her fifth husband. He's the one uh, who has also been charged with murder. Um, they've both been charged with murder now. Um, she was now with her fifth husband, Chad Guy Daybell, and I'll go into both of Chad's personality issues because he's the one with the, the um, end of the world cult, the last days cult uh, that he created, um, wrote books about and spoke about and then met her. And then she joined his group um, and became his wife, I guess, for this life and for the many hereafter and the many they were married before and all their last lives. Anyway, um, so they started questioning, the police questioned uh, Lori and her, her new husband, Chad Daybell. And they, they claimed that JJ was staying with a family friend, Melanie Gibb in Arizona, where they had lived before moving to Idaho. When the police reached Gibb by phone, she told the police that Joshua was not with her and had not been with her for a few months. Actually, that's that's a that's a very condensed version of that story. Actually, I believe originally she actually lied for her and said the child was with her and then eventually confessed to the police the child wasn't. 
More than a week later, Gibb called police saying that both Lori and Chad had asked her to lie to, to, to police about JJ's whereabouts. Yeah, there we go. But she refused. I think she did. And then she just gave, gave up the info. Um, police efforts to lo locate JJ led to the discovery that Tylee was also missing. So now we've got both kids missing. All right. Complicating circumstances around the disappearance was a string of suspicious deaths. Lori's estranged husband, Charles Vallow, okay, that's the fourth husband, was shot and killed in July 2019 by her brother, Alex Cox. Remember, remember the guy at the park, Yellowstone with the kids? There's Alex right there um, with the kids. He shot and killed her fourth husband. All right. Supposedly because her fourth husband attacked him and with a bat and he had to shoot him. I'll get into that later. Um, so, uh, yeah. And then Alex Cox, uh, he claimed self-defense, the, the brother. And then he later died of a blood clot. After the two children disappeared, he died. Okay. I don't know what's wrong with the medical examiners, but apparently he had gone to Mexico to buy a whole bunch of drugs and, um, <clears throat> and apparently took himself out. But then again, it's something I'll get into. All right. So... Let's see what else is here. Brandon Boudreau, the then estranged husband of Lori's niece, Melanie, the one who was asked to lie, um, was attacked, in, uh, where was, was shot in the driveway of his Gilbert, Arizona home from a vehicle still registered to Charles Vallow. So she, <laughs> so she lent her brother, Alex, her dead husband's vehicle so he could go shoot the husband of this other woman. So I guess she wanted to help Melanie out. Anyway, he didn't get killed, but he went into hiding because he was scared to death for a good reason. Anyway, then, let's see, Chad's wife, Chad, remember Chad? Okay, Chad, which is her fifth husband, right? Uh, let me th show up, find a picture of his wife, uh, Chad and his wife. Um, and then so I'm going to go back over all of this in slower motion to explain what happened. But this is the abbreviated version because otherwise you won't even know the basic story. Where's Chad? Hold on a second. I have a picture of Chad here somewhere. Oh, Chad. <laughs> As I said, I have so many pictures. It's ridiculous. Uh, maybe he's over here. Where's Chad and his wife? Um, oh, here they are. No, no, that's not him. That's not him. Uh, oh, here they are. Okay. There's Chad right here. There's his wife, Tammy, and their five children, you see. And so now... Let's see, Chad's wife, Tammy Daybell, was attacked in her driveway, but she thought somebody was shooting paintballs at her. No, that was a, that was a brother Alex trying to kill her. Um, but Alex is not around now, so we cannot question him because he's oddly dead. Um, so then a few weeks later on October 19th, she died in her sleep. How about that? Wouldn't you know? Um <laughs> It was initially recorded as natural causes. Mm -hmm. uh, no postmortem or autopsy was done because her husband said, yeah, we don't need that done. I knew she was going to die. so <laughs> We don't need that done. Um, and so they didn't do the autopsy. After Chad and Lori's marriage, two weeks after, okay, two weeks after, after she dies. So now, now Lori's husband's been shot by her brother. She dies in, in her sleep, supposedly. And now they're both free. And so they wait a whole two weeks. Yes, you heard me right. Two whole weeks because, you know, there's that period of mourning you got to go through. But here they are on a beach in, in um, Kauai and Hawaii. And um, they're now having, they had the marriage ceremony and they're just happy as all get out. Oh, the children are missing by now too. But, you know, they're free. No husband, no wife. Her kids are out of the picture. Yeah. Happy day. Happy day. Okay. So now they're having a, they have their wedding. Yep. They do. And then they became suspicious law enforcement. Like, <laughs> and so they exhume Tammy's corpse and do an autopsy on it. And they have not released that information as to why she died. So on February 20th, 2020, Lori was arrested in Kauai, Hawaii and charged with desertion and non-support of her dependent children because the police kept asking her where her kids were and she didn't want to answer. She'd rather get married and have him play. Is that, is that a uk no, uh, oh, uk ukulele? Yes, playing an ukulele to her so she can do this. You see, she's doing that. She's happy. <laughs> she got all kinds of dead people around her, including her kids. 
Um, anyway, uh, let's see. And so then she was extradited to Idaho and transported there by officials on March 5th of 2020. On June 9th of 2020, police executed a search warrant at Chad's home and discovered the remains of JJ entirely in the backyard. He, he used to be a grave digger and he knew how to dig a grave. And so he dug some in the backyard and their bodies ended up there. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so now they were all arrested and they've been charged with first degree murder. So that's where we are today. So there is no question that there's a whole bunch of shenanigans that went on with, with this, with this couple. And the question though, is why? Okay. Why did these things happen? Um, I, by the way, I took this wonderful picture. This this is still in my doorway. This is a this is a spider that's weaving a web in my doorway, and it's so beautiful. I took pictures of it, and it reminds me of Lori. So I use this for the show, but I, I have to keep ducking into my door because I'm I hate the ruinous web. But you know, one day, poor 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 sucker. Yeah, um, probably not going to be able to keep his web there. So anyway, let me check on your comments before I go on to the next part of the show. So that was the abbreviated version. And I don't know how to make that better without doing a five hour show, which you can get someplace else. Um, but so essentially Lori was married five times. Her fourth husband was murdered by her brother who claimed it was self-defense. Then after that, she married, uh, then Chad's wife, Chad's wife died in her sleep naturally. And then two weeks later they got married but their, their, but Lori's kids, her two kids that were living with her, were already disappeared. Now she has one more son, Colby, but Colby was uh, was uh, grown up and living elsewhere and was married and had a child of his own. So she didn't kill him, knock him off because he wasn't interfering with her life. So that's the basics of it. The, the police are looking into the murders of four people. Uh, Lori's, Lori's husband... Chad's wife and Lori's two kids that were living with her at the time. And that's why they're, they're now have a trial coming up on all of those charges. Now, Alex, the brother who is believed to have been the one that killed, well, he, he did kill Lori's husband. There's no question about that. He, the police came and he, he said, Oh, he attacked me with a bat. I shot him in self-defense. He killed Lori's husband. Um, the two kids, he hasn't been proven. He killed them, but the evidence is, pushing, pointing to Alex having killed the two, the two children. Um, who killed Lori? I mean, who killed uh, Tammy, Chad's wife? I don't know. Did, did Chad do that himself? Not sure. Did Lori actually kill anybody? There's no proof that she killed anybody, but there is proof that she certainly was behind a whole lot of the conspiracy to kill. So that's where the police are today. The question is that I'm going to get into now is why? Why did all of this happen? So let me check your comments before I go on to the why did all this happen and go into her childhood and all the issues of cults and uh, de delusions and, and all of this kind of thing. Um, so let me check to see what you have been saying while I'm here. Um, so, <laughs> Oh, that's very nice. Nancy says, I love your book, The Profiler. It came yesterday, halfway done. I'm glad you like it. Um, uh, now, Caroline is trying to tell Lisa because Lisa is not from the United States. And that's where all this is happening. George Ryan was number three. We'll get to George. I'm sorry. Joe Ryan was number three. And I'm going to get to Joe Ryan in a minute. So number three. Yeah, Joe Ryan's dead, too. I'll get to that in a minute. And number four are dead. Maybe number five, Chad is safer in prison. <laughs> Good point. All right. <laughs> um, let's see. <laughs> let's, uh... Uh, okay, I'm not sure what that means. I'm just checking here. <laughs> Lila says, we're only a few minutes in and I'm so confused. I think I need a nap to reconstitute my brain. You're correct, uh, Lila. And I'm going to go back now and I'll explain things as they go through. All I can, that's all I can say. You got two people in prison for the um, murders of four people, husband, wife, two kids. Okay. And the two of the, the, the adults in the, the Chad and Lori 
were the were the at that point heads of this supposed cult of uh, that was like a Mormon. As they start, they're Mormons that kind of got chucked out of the Mormon Church eventually for their bizarre beliefs. I think Chad got chucked out. I think Lori was. was had they gotten chucked out? Yeah, a lot of a lot of people had gotten chucked out who were involved because they were no longer standard Mormons following the Book of Mormon. They were making up a new book. Chad made up a whole new book and a whole bunch of new theories, and I'll get into that. So the question is, this is this is what was considered a cult, and they were uh, Chad was the originator of the cult, and Lori then hooked up with Chad. She became interested in the cult, and she joined, and then became his. Essentially, his wife. Well, she became his wife eventually, and originally just his fan, then his wife. Right? Um, yes, it's 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 that's why. Well, that's why I talk about this web. It's it's so complicated. But I'm going to try to get into the whys more than all this every teeny detail because it'll take you a while on that one. Um, <laughs> I see there's so much chattering. I have to list, listen carefully. I get so lost with this case. Yeah. Okay. I'm I hope I got that base the basics down. Now, the question comes, <laughs> sour crime is here with a proper thing. In the South, we call this case a hot mess. <laughs> this it is. I'm going to make it easier as we go on. But I just had to get the basics out without taking 10 hours. Believe me, I felt the same way about this case. I'm like, what the, what the heck? I'm so confused. All right. But before I go on to the story of Lori, I'm going to, I will be talking about her family, her, 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 her childhood growing up, because it's going to become very important. Then the different men she married and then what she did when she married these men, what she chose to do with her life until she met Chad, Chad, the guy who, with the, with the, the theories, the cult theories. And then, um, and then I'll talk about the crimes. Okay. But before I do that, what I want to talk about is this, because I want you to be ready ready for the information I'm going to give you about what, what, what was the psychology of Lori Vallow Daybell? What was her psychology? What was Chad Daybell's psychology that would cause them to kill off these people? Um, you could say allegedly killed them off, but allegedly, allegedly. Just every time I speak, just think of allegedly so I don't get sued. Okay. Anyway, so let me move forward with, I'm going to put this up first. Um, no, I'm going to put this up first. Okay. So I did listen to Dr. Grande's uh, very short version of this. Um, and as you can see, he's pointed out all the dead people around Chad and Lori, which is cute. I like this little thing. Um, and then there, there's Dr. Grande in the corner. Now he points out possibilities and I like some of his thinking and some I disagree with. As says, you know, as often happens. Uh, but I want to point out his his different choices of possibilities first because I want to discuss those possibilities. All right. So what did Dr. Grande say about Lori Vallow? So so we're going we're going specifically to Lori at this point. Um, so he's looking at her history um, and what what could be wrong with this girl. All right. So. He comes up with, I would say, he talks about the possibility of psychopathy and the possibility possibility of delusional thinking and a thing called Copgrass syndrome. Um, so let's start with delusional thinking. Because this gets this is a very tricky psychological issue. What is delusional thinking? Now, most of us think of delusional thinking when we have people who uh, are disconnected from reality, when they hear voices uh, telling them what to do. We think of schizophrenia, uh, where that is. There's a lot of delusional uh, thinking with schizophrenia, where the person does not know what reality is. Um, and you can you know usually schizophrenics do have been institutionalized. They, they're usually given medication. It's rare that schizophrenics are running around without any um, uh, contact with uh, therapy of some sort, because usually their behavior is so noticeable 
that their the family is going, whoa, something's wrong with this person, you know, and people around them are going, okay, they're saying crazy stuff now. Um, and I don't mean crazy cult type stuff. I don't mean, I don't mean religious in this particular, this, his, uh, Chad, uh, Daybell's version of his religious viewpoint. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about stuff like, um, just weird stuff where the words don't go together. They go into a jumble, uh, word salad kind of things where nothing they say makes any sense, where they are literally hearing voices. I remember sitting behind a woman on, on the bus and, um, she was talking, I thought on her phone. And she was, she was in front of me and she would go, yes, I think so. Tomorrow? Well, let me see. Maybe I'll, I might be available tomorrow. Uh, okay, maybe Wednesday too. Then when I got up and looked back, she wasn't on her phone. She had no phone with her. She was a homeless woman with no phone, no ear things, anything. She was talking to somebody who was not there. That's schizophrenia. Okay, so that's the kind of thing people will notice. Schizophrenia was not noticed in the life of Lori Daybell. It was not noticed in the life of Chad either. No sign of schizophrenia from either one of them. Both of them were able to conduct their lives extremely well. They could go to work. They could do jobs. They were ra they. When you say, oh, but, but their thinking wasn't rational. I'm talking about their daily stuff. Um, they weren't hearing voices as they were walking around the kitchen. You know, um, they could function very well. They were, they were crafty. They were clever. Uh, they, they made choices based on, uh, they made, had decision-making going on. That was, they were not schizophrenic. Neither one had ever been institutionalized. So one thing that, uh, Dr. Uh, Grande mentions about, uh, whether they were, they were, they had this thing called cop grass syndrome, because let me, let me see if I can point out Chad Daybell's, uh, viewpoint. I might, might have to stop here and just tell you what the basic concept of dead Chad Daybell was. All right. So, so when we're looking at delusion, we have to look at, first of all, what, what, what Chad Daybell was into. Okay. A little while ago, I talked about a guy who went to Mexico and, and killed his two children because he thought, um, he thought that his children were, you know, lizard people. <laughs> um, and that, and that, uh, they had to be killed because they were lizard people. And the guy who promoted that particular thing, and I, let me get his name straight this time. Oh, hold on a second. Ah. Oh, I disappeared. <laughs> Sorry, I hit the wrong button. That <laughs> was like you're in the, your, your, your camera's gone. Thanks very much. All right. So this guy, which I pronounced his name wrong when I did this last, that show, I called him David Ick. Um, apparently it's, let me see if I got it right now. Ike. Um, I still like Ick better. Anyway, David Ike is a, a, a he's he has a very interesting. A cons, he's a conspiracy theorist. That's what he's called. He mixes politics with religion, with with uh, uh, all kinds of interesting things about aliens and how he ended up on the planet and that we're coming from. We have lizard. There's lizard brains somewhere. There are lizards and people, and and there are lizard people out there. And there there's e, there, that's what e, is evil. It's very convoluted um but he's very he's very very well known and and a lot of people follow him and think he's brilliant i read his stuff i don't think he's brilliant but i think he's more brilliant than chad <laughs> iq wise ike is up here chad is down here chad is not that bright um and his writings are juvenile in my opinion so ike I, ike's stuff is his iq is very high I, ike and and I've and I've read I I tried to read some of his stuff. Um, let's see, is this one of his thing? Yeah. Uh, oh Lord, um, he's he mixes a lot of science and science and metaphysical stuff and political stuff. He mixes it all together in a fairly high level way. Now, when I read this, I think it's nonsense. But a lot of people are so impressed by his brilliance. You see that they like, oh my God. Well, so I believe, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if Chad, I don't, I didn't get to, I didn't see that part. If there was something about Chad, like even understanding what Ike was doing, but Chad started writing all these books and his original books that he wrote pretty much failed because you go to Amazon, they're not that popular. Let me tell you. And people go, 
these, these fiction stories are very juvenile. But then he started getting into much more uh, end, end, of, uh, end of the world type of scenarios, um, much more religious religious based. And here we have the edge of heaven, living on the edge of heaven. Uh, he claimed that he had had two near death experiences that took, took him to the other side and ripped the veil away. And he, and he said, you know, spirits are talking to him and God is talking to him. Oh, lots of people are talking to him, but not in the schizophrenic way, mind you. I want you to understand that just because somebody says, I heard this voice or I was told doesn't mean they're schizophrenic. It means they're making up something that they want you to believe. Uh, because it's hard to say, hey, these are all my ideas. It's, it works better on certain people to say those ideas came from the beyond, whether you're channeling, like some people say, I'm channeling to the spirit of your dead, whatever, uh, or it can be through meditation. It can be through prayer. It can be, there's a lot of preachers who say, God told me. And it isn't that they actually heard God going, hey, take your people. <laughs> you know, except, you know, when you read, you know, certain uh, religious uh literature in those oftentimes God does speak or Jehovah speaks or Allah speaks. You know, you have these things in the literature and because it's more convincing than if just some dude down the street like this says, Oh, it's just my idea. So what you do is you bring in uh, that you were told this and you're just a conduit and it makes people, it works on people and they like it now. So I, th I think he's like a really, a really, Poor, poor rep replica of David Icke. I do. I just think his stuff is really low level. Um, but he got a following. And maybe he got a following of people who weren't into such intellectual stuff. David Icke is very intellectual. This guy is not intellectual at all. He's a down-to-earth dude, you see. And he can relate to the regular people, theoretically. And so he got a following. Now... What, what somebody said about what he wrote was this, which I thought was pretty funny, actually. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. That's not it. Where is it? Where is it? Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Finding it. Okay. This is a guy that married one of the ladies in the group. Pulaski had thought the beliefs fun and exciting. So he joined, he joined this, what was considered a cult. He joined the cult because he thought it was fun and exciting. And I want you to remember fun and exciting because the reason a lot of people do join groups is because they want to do something. They want something interesting. Their life is dull or just not going anywhere. They just don't feel important enough. So they join sometimes just really a church. Uh, they could join a club, uh, a fraternity, a sorority. They could join a, uh, <laughs> a YouTube group. <laughs> So that you, so we, we all want to be, we want to be involved. We want to be excited. And so this guy said that. And I think it's a very reasonable thing to say. He thought the beliefs were fun and exciting, exciting and hadn't taken them too seriously. Now that's also important because sometimes what happens is people will join things and they're like, they love what they join, but they're not necessarily in tune or in agreement with like some of the things they might say, Hey, 80% of it, I'm good with 20%, not so much. And I'm not going to go there. But, you know, I recognize that people have different ideas and I'm not going to crush these people because, you know, within this group, they believe something I don't. So I'm just going to go with the basics. But here's what he said. It felt like many of them were ripped out of a Dungeons and Dragon manual. Between the stats, accounts of dark and light weapons, it sounded like someone had created a tabletop Book of Mormon game based on the Bible. So I think this guy saw what I saw, that he really did put together a very low level kind of gaming type thing, but with a religious bent to it without the game. Um, then he says this, perhaps even more chilling was his definition of zombies as spirits trapped in limbo and unable to progress to a new mortal life. Um, so this is true. So what he did was he started rating people as to their lightness or darkness. And if they got too dark, they were, that meant they were zombies, you know, because I maybe watched too many zombie movies. I don't know what's wrong with this dude. But anyway, they, he called them zombies. And what he would say was that that their the real spirit of themselves was now gone and they've been replaced by some zombie creature, either somebody with a different name who's just pretending to be that person, but they were a dark, evil thing. And therefore, what's on the outside here is just a costume. And the real person, like Pat Brown is not really here right now. Pat Brown's spirit is elsewhere and fully alive elsewhere. But what's here is a zombie with my face. Okay. 
That's what he pushed. Now, they will say this. Now, the only way forward is to await the death of their current possessed body, he wrote, alluding to Chad's warped rationale for murder. Now, be careful of this. Just because he, he claimed that people might have been possessed and had zombies and their real spirits were not there. And therefore, if you kill that person, you're not really killing them. You're just killing a zombie. Their spirits are elsewhere. That's his rationale for murdering people. I'm going to say that's not it. I'm going to say that's his excuse for murdering people, not his rationale. All right. So this is the kind of this is the kind of um, world that he had set up this whole concept of end of the world. We're all going to gather in one place because the world's coming to an end. We've we've all been here for many lives and this is the one we have now. And now we have light beings and dark dark beings and I'm a light being and Lori's a light being and we're married now in this life because we were together before or we'll be together forever, whatever he came up with. And people who wanted more in their lives, some of them became very fascinated by this as they do a fascinated with Ike's thing. Um, now the question is, let's talk about the zombies for a minute because this is one thing that um, Dr. Grande points out. He said, could the reason that Lori and, and Chad be willing to, for the deaths of their spouses and the children, could it be because they thought of them as zombies? All right, so he talks up, there's a thing called Capgras syndrome. Now, I think it's called the syndrome. That people, you know, psychiatrists love syndrome words. That means they don't really know if it's true. So anyway, the concept that this is, see, there's a person, but that person's, that's not, that's a zombie with using the face of a person and it's called Capgras right here, cop grass delusion. Okay, it's delusion. A psychiatric disorder in which a person holds a delusion that a friend, a spouse, a parent, or other close family member has been replaced by an identical imposter. Okay. Now here's where this is not true for either Lori or Chad. Neither one of them were schizophrenic or nor did they have dementia or Alzheimer's. Cop grass seems to be something that happens when you have a brain disorder to the point where when you see a person, your brain does not recognize them quite right. So you, you start and you don't recognize their behaviors. So what you do is you think that that's not really the person. So so all of a sudden I might look at my daughter and think that's not really my daughter. She's not acting right because I have Alzheimer's or something, you know, and my I can't function properly. Lori and Chad didn't have dementia. They didn't have a brain disorder. So cop grass is ridiculous. They did not actually think psych, uh, brain, their brains weren't telling them that these people were zombies. No. And did they, but did they have a delusion through their magical thinking, through, through, through their, through their, their, uh, through Chad's development of his, this new religion, essentially, that people could become zombies. It, so then we come down to delusional thinking. Now, so now we're down to cop grass. Check that out. So, so, so we're here with, um, with, uh, Dr. Grande and he's thinking, okay, now he's got a choice of two things. He's got a choice of delusional thinking or psychopathy. All right. Delusional thinking or psychopathy. Okay. So Dr. Grande is now going to tell us about why he thinks it's not psychopathy, okay? And let me tell, give you a psychopathy checklist. Now, I'm gonna refer to this later. This is, this, this is one of the versions of a psychopathy checklist. Uh, a superficial charm, grandiose thinking, uh, prone to boredom, needing stimulation, pathological lying, manipulative, lack of remorse, shallow affect, callous lack of empathy, parasitic lifestyle, poor behavioral controls, promiscuous sexual behavior, uh, early behavioral problems. Now, this is where this is where Dr. Grande gets stuck. 12. OK, and we'll come back to that. Uh, lack of realistic long term goals, impulsivity, irresponsibility, failure to accept responsibility, many short term matter relationships. That certainly does apply to Lori. Uh, juvenile delinquency. Not necessarily in these two cases. There's no juvenile delinquency. Uh, criminal versatility and uh, rev revocation of conditional release. Uh, that's if you're in and you get put back in. Okay. Dr. Grande thinks neither one are psychopaths because he does not believe they had early behavioral problems. He believed that uh, 
but both Lori and uh, Chad had, were really put together people, that they were just fine until they met each other and because of the religion that Chad had developed that she became entranced with, that he was already entranced with it. Somewhere, he said, okay, the guy was an odd duck and started having this end of the world thing, uh, ideas and started elaborating on them and writing books and getting into that. So he definitely had some issues going that direction, but she never even thought about that kind of stuff really until she met him and then became infatuated and impressed by his thinking and therefore sucked into his, that, that stuff. But until then she was, a fabulous, wonderful human being. And he was a great guy too. He had, he had only been married once, had five kids, was a good husband to his wife, supposedly. She was just this wonderful, sweet, charming person. And let me, let me tell you what his sister, the sister says. Um, the sister of Lori, um, uh, they were the sister and the mom, they were on uh, in this Netflix documentary. And they said this about her. Let's see. Here we, are. Here we are. This is a sister. Her name is Summer Cox. And I'm going to go into the family history in a minute. And this is Janice, her mother. There is no way she did anything to them. There's just no way. Why did they think this? Well, let's see what they said. Oh, sorry. Wrong one. Uh, okay. Got to go back here a second. All right. I think this is it. All right. A week later, Janice Cox and Summer Shiflet broke their silence with an exclusive sit-down interview with Phoenix's CBS 5. They said their only goal was to tell the truth about Lori, complaining that the media had falsely portrayed her as a, quote, monster and, quote, a heartless villain. Summer said, and that couldn't be further from the truth. I'm really hoping that by us speaking out, that people might soften their hearts and see she's really a loving, sweet, warm person. She's more beautiful on the inside than she is on the outside. And she was, by the way, a very beautiful woman. I mean, in my opinion, a traditionally beautiful woman and the, the kind that goes in beauty pageants, which she did. Um, and that's why it was easy for her to some extent to get men to like her because she was very attractive and that's very useful. And I'll, usefulness comes in handy. You know? um, okay. So also uh, Janice, uh, she speculated that Lori might be hiding them, that this is when the children were still missing. Uh, that Lori might've been hiding them in a bunker somewhere for their safety because remember Lori had told, told the many people that the children were in danger because of her ex or because of her husband at the time. Uh, and so she was hiding them. Then they were asked if Lori was involved in the death of her late husband, Charles Vallow. Oh, not even a little bit replied summer. I know for a fact that she did not conspire to kill Charles in any way, shape or form, except that she was there when he got shot. Um, when asked about allegations of Alex being the family hitman, which he was, um, his mother laughed, and that mother, I would say, a, a massive narcissist. I think that's a lot of where the problem started, along with her very crazy husband. So this is a dysfunctional family of the nth degree, and I'll get into that. I couldn't help but laugh. Alex is the most laid-back person. He's been funny his whole life. He did a comedian. He was a stand-up comedian at one point, and he wasn't bad. He was very protective of, of Colby and Tylee. Well, not so much for Tylee. Um, he said, I tasered a pedophile. I'm willing to admit it. Yeah, he did. He, he tasered uh, a third husband. And I'll get into the accusations that he supposedly sexually abused uh, the two children, um, which comes from Lori. Uh, anyway, uh, he's always owned up to anything he's done wrong. Mm, I don't think so. At the end of the interview, Janice was asked about Lori and Chad being on a beach in Kauai while there was a nationwide hunt for the children. It didn't look good, we agree, she said, but we knew they weren't missing to her. That's a, there's a, that's a whole difference if your children are missing or if they're not missing to her. They're claiming they're not missing to her because she's got them hidden away. Even though the police are asking her, she, you know, asking her what happened to the children, she still thinks she needs to hide the children from whomever, because everybody's pretty much dead, so who's she hiding them from now? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to say why she didn't wasn't worried that they were missing because she knew exactly where they were buried in the backyard of Chad's house. All right. Um, then we have this thing. Now, here's something they said later when they found out the kids were like dead. 
Um, I'm so torn. It's such a conflicting feeling to know this person's been good her whole life and then made this error in judgment and got sucked into the vortex of this man. So they're blaming everything on Chad. She was the kindest, most wonderful person and nothing would have happened except for Chad. And you'll see that is absolutely not true. I feel for her. I just have so much compassion toward her because I know that's not what she would have ever done on her own. And I hate her for that. Okay, they, they got a little hate there. Uh, so basically, she would never have done anything if it hadn't been for Chad. Now, there is a truth that you put those two together, gasoline and fire. It kind of reminds me a lot of, um, of uh, let's see, who, 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 who you got, you got um, uh, Paul, uh, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homoka in Canada. Maybe if they hadn't met, they wouldn't have done quite what they did. Uh, Bonnie and Clyde, those kind of things. You have sometimes that when you have two people who are in their own right dangerous get together, they're even more dangerous. So I think in this case, Chad might not have been involved in what happened to his wife or, or uh, Lori's husband and children had he not fell for Lori. So, hey, it's not all about it. Lori got sucked in. Chad got sucked in somewhere there. And maybe Lori wouldn't have off them if she hadn't been with Chad and gone, planned to go off and, you know, have this fantasy life she had in Hawaii and onward. So they were not healthy together. Let's put it that way. Let's see if there's anything more here. Oh, okay, I did that one. Okay. So now, now we go back to this. He says there was no sign of psychopathy. The family says there was no sign of psychopathy. I'm going to get to that in the next part of the show. But before I do that, I do want to talk about delusions. Because delusions, what, what are they? You know, um, it's an interesting topic because one person's delusions is another one's you know, they think the one person says this is this is the way things are. And the other person says you have a delusion. Um, what does that mean? Um, OK, I don't want to get into major religious issues here, but I do want to point out that. Everybody in life has a way of looking at life. For example, an atheist will say religious people are delusional because there's no proof that there's a God. There is no proof that there's uh, life after death. And to some extent, they're right. There's not, there's not such solid proof that you could say, this, yeah, how can you not see this? So, so the atheists will say religious people are delusional. Then the religious people will look back at the atheists and go, no, you're delusional. Do you honestly think that everything is an accident? You no, know, if I take a bunch of Legos, a whole box of Legos, and chuck it across the room, it's not going to be, turn into a, a beautiful hotel and tower. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a bunch of Legos lying on the floor. So obviously there's, there's, there's some kind of wisdom behind the whole creation of what's on Earth. You can't have the, the level of beauty and the, the num number of animals and birds and, and you know, that, that do all these incredible things like the spider, the spider web I just showed you is hanging in my door. What an incredible spider web. And each animal has a brilliant way of living and, and a brilliant use of all of its bodies and its faculties. That can't be accidental. And hey, you know, why, why, what, how can you say there's no purpose in life? Because why, you know, you just think we're here for no reason. We're just, we're just, I mean, we came from nowhere. We go to nowhere. So what's the point of anything then if you think that way? And, Hey, you know, uh, we have we have in our own heads morals. Why do we have morals at all? You know, where did the Ten Commandments come from? And most religions have very similar basic concepts. No, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. What? What does it matter? Hey, you know, if if there's no if there's no God, if there's no spiritual world, what does any of it matter? Just go for it. You know, take whatever you want. Just beat each other up. And then the atheists will go, well, we do that. <laughs> That's why we have wars and slavery. <laughs> you know why people cheat on each other? Well, and the other person will say, yes, we do, but we know it's wrong. Why do we think it's wrong? Because of our values that come from a spiritual realm. And so you can argue these things back and forth. Which is delusion? Which is not delusion? Um, 
And, and, and what happens with all, so when, when we go to cults and people say, oh, that's a cult, why would they label that a cult and not something else a cult? You know, uh, you've got, you've got um, fraternities, you've got um, lodges who do all kinds of weird stuff. <laughs> you know, they have practices that are kind of unusual. Like you have to join an order, you got to get to wear some kind of crown on your head and put a robe on and you have to chant some words. Why is, is that not, is that delusional? Why are they doing that? Um, so every religion has its basic ideas and then it has its history, which they, they, they goes down through the generations, either by word or by, you know, written or oral, uh, it goes down through the generations. People, uh, believe either accept the stories as allegories or they accept the stories as representations or they accept the stories as absolute. And to each person, they have their own level of what they, what they, what they think about these stories. And each area of the world, these stories come out of their culture. The stories come out of their, uh, sometimes tr tribalism will develop certain um, absolutes, you know, where you have the certain um, uh, specific things you have to do in a, uh, their religion to be, that's, that, that is a requirement. Um, and so that all varies. It varies to where they, where, where they live. Um, and you can see that. And you can see that. And, and then there's breakoffs of each religion. So you have the Christian religion, but then that breaks into different little groups. And then you have, you have uh, 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 Islam and that breaks into certain groups too. And then they fight each other. And then you've got Hinduism, which has got many groups. And so every group, every religion breaks into different groups because they formulate different ideas. Now, this one will say this one's delusional, even within the same basic framework. So even, even with, you know, Christianity, Islam, is Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, whatever you go, there's going to be some group that says they've got it wrong. They're delusional. They're, they're believing things they shouldn't be believing. They should be believing uh, this over here. So now you get to cults. How are they more wrong <laughs> than anything else? So, so you have Ike that comes along and he has his viewpoint of what, what's true now. And there's a whole bunch of people who follow him and think that makes sense. Now we can't prove it makes sense, but in our heads it makes sense because we need to understand why we're here on earth. We need to understand where we came from and where we're going. We need to understand this. And then, then uh, Chad, Day, Day, uh, he comes along. I almost forgot his last name, Daybell. Chad Daybell comes along and he creates, he, he breaks off from Mormon, the regular traditional Mormon church. He breaks away from them. And he says, this is what I think is really where we came from and where we're going. And then he starts elaborating and elaborating and elaborating. But that is what happens in every religion, even agnosticism. It happens that you elaborate and elaborate and elaborate to defend what you think is could be true, what you want to believe, what you do believe. So to some extent, we all delude ourselves into believing whatever we want to believe. Um, and as long as we're not harming other people, as long as we aren't breaking the basic moral code, it's not necessarily wrong or right. So I can't say that what he, uh, Day, Day Bell came up with was any necessarily worse than what somebody else comes up with. And so consequently, you can call it a cult, you can call it delusions, but does that mean their thinking is actually delusional? Now, this is what I want to point out about delusional thinking. Because you believe something or want to believe something or want to explore that as a basis for why we're here on earth, why we should be what we are. And, you know, I'm 67 now where we're going, <laughs> which I might get sooner than some people. And I kind of like to go someplace. Um, because I want to explore something and, 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 and think about it and possibly believe it in my own mind. I say, this is, I want to go, I want to believe this because this makes me more comfortable. This makes me give, have hope. Um, it makes me have hope. I'll, my, I'll see my parents again. Or if, you know, you know, it gives me hope that I, I have some future. I'm not just, you know, a few years. I was like, well, <laughs> only I, I'm, I'm on YouTube forever, maybe, <laughs> but nowhere else. And I, that kind of sucks for me, you know. So I understand where people want to explore and 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 think these things could be so. Now, it's not delusional in the sense that you have the right to think these things. What becomes delusional is if 
you act in a certain way upon information that is questionable to the point where it becomes harmful. And so it's not delusional like schizophrenics, like schizophrenia and dementia. The reason it's delusional is because you, you have no question it's reality because you, you, if you hear a voice, I really hear a voice and that voice says something, kill your husband. The voice says that you believe 100% that that's real. That, and, and it, if it didn't happen, it is a 100% delusion. Um, but if you just think that you should kill your husband, that's not a delusion. If you just think that, okay, I'm going, I'm going with a theory that people I don't like are zombies and they're interfering with my life and they're making my life not as good as I want my life to be. And I kind of want their money because, uh, <clears throat> uh, one thing about Lori is, and, and Chad is they, oh, let me, let me show you the money they got. So this, this is kind of important. Um, so along with the fact that these people were in their way, here we have when Chad Vallow was killed, he had a $1 million policy that Lori thought she was going to get. She didn't get it because he had suspicions that she was going to kill him for many reasons and his money. So he gave that over to, I believe his sister. Uh, she did end up getting $4,000 a month off of something else. And so she wasn't totally bummed, but she was pissed. She didn't get the million. Then when Tammy was Oh, died in her sleep. Uh, Chad got $430,000. That's what they used to go get married and hang out in, in uh, Kauai and have a great, great time. And they bought this, they, they rented this huge fancy house. I mean, they spent the money, believe me. And then she also took money from her dead children. She had, I think, um, uh, her daughters had money coming in uh, from some social security thing. And she had that moved into her bank account. Her daughter wasn't happy about it, but it went straight to her bank account. And when her daughter went missing, she kept collecting the money and using it. So now we have people who are after their money. Now I, I do have to laugh at uh, Doc, Dr. Grande. I, I like this one line that Dr. Grande had. He said, well, you know, <laughs> Dee Dee's got a, how did he put that? You can't be, you know, deities need money <laughs> to, to do what they need to do. You know, you can't be a poor deity, right? So he said it better than that. I forgot what he said exactly. But anyway, I, it made me laugh because I'm like, hey, you don't want to be a poor deity because if you're going to be uh, like a, a god and goddess, which is what they were claiming to be, um, you know, you can't be poor. You know, <laughs> So you got to get some money from someplace. So, but, you know, the problem comes down to, again, is, what are we looking at when we're looking at delusion? Was he deluded or did he you know when he started out writing these books, he was getting attention, more attention and more attention and more attention. And then Lori wanted more attention and more attention. So they wanted to believe what they wanted to believe. And I say believe when the people say they believe this, I don't know that they actually believed it. They enjoyed the concept of it. They enjoyed giving out this information. They enjoyed people following them because they gave this information out. They enjoyed playing the game like a like a fantasy game. They were playing a fantasy game. And the same can be true said in, in many religions um, and in many types of things in life. People like playing a part, which is either a, a, a very devoted person or a very brilliant person. They join Menza, you know, uh, they want to they want to be um, uh, they want to join become I don't know, I'm trying to think of a few other examples. Uh, they just want to be somebody special. So they join these different things and then they follow whatever that is required for them to be that special person. How much they believe 100% it's true, we'll never know because we can't get into other people's heads. So I don't, so when they, when he says he thinks they were delusional, because that's kind of where he came from. Uh, Dr. Grande says he sees no proof that in their earlier lives they had psychopathic behaviors until they got together. So he believes he became deluded, then Lori became deluded, then they del became deluded together. So he believes and they were highly delusional. But yet, I don't think that takes away, um, that doesn't, I don't, first of all, I don't think they were delusional. I think delusional is only when you get to the point where you absolutely can't tell right, reality from unreality. Uh, and they knew what they were doing. They were very, they weren't, you know, crazy people doing crazy stuff that they didn't know what was going on. They plan things very carefully, although they weren't that smart. So that's how they ended up getting caught. They really weren't that bright, but 
I don't see the delusions of schizophrenia or delusions because of drugs. They didn't do drugs. They didn't see delusions because of, I don't see that. I don't call that delusional thinking. I believe that's the thinking they chose to follow, the thinking that they chose to follow, the way they want to live their lives. Um, so now I'm going to address, was Lori really a psychopath? And if she was really a psychopath, then she damned well didn't believe in what she claimed she believed in. And let me stop before I go into the psychopathy part. I'll just check your comments here. Um, now, let's see. Uh, Netflix really pushed that narrative of the good Lori, but anyone following this case knows what a piece of work she was before Chad. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point. Ah, <laughs> wait a minute. I like this one. Pat. Excellent research and show. Okay, thank you. Um, wait a minute, where's that funny one? Wait a minute, I just read this one. I really liked it. Well, that's an interesting point. Delusions of spiritual grandeur. Yes, I, I, I want to comment on that before we go on. One of the things about psychopathy is, is a delusion, is not a delusion, but a desire for grandeur. Um, and again, there's a, it's kind of a continuum. We all want to be something in life, which is why we work hard, which is why... We maybe get education or do good on, on our jobs. Why we want to, you know, the person you might pick for your husband or wife, you might pick them because they can give you a more grandiose life, you know, whatever, a more grandeur in your life. We all kind of want some of that. The problem is when it comes, when you have such grandiose thinking that it's over the top to where you start harming other people to get your grant your grandeur in your life. That's that's where it becomes really questionable. Um, I like, this is the comment I liked. <laughs> I thought it was very funny. Good good her whole life, ask her exes. And yeah, I'm going to get into the exes part in just a minute. Those poor kids, all of the poor kids. Oh my God, just poor kids. Um, uh, <laughs> so let me get to, um, let me go to the psychopathy issue. Now, let me return to, now I'm going to try to put up, okay, this is tricky. Uh, so I'm trying to find a way here to show her family lineage. Now, um, where is this one? Okay. Now, if you're on, this is, this is sort of a basic one. And this is kind of funny because it's not actually entirely true, which I find rather weird. So here we have Barry Cox and Janice Cox. Janice Cox is the mother who said her daughter was just adorable. And, um, and uh, this is Barry Cox, uh, and he 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 um, he was kind of a, cur a really interesting guy. He fought against the IRS and thought they they were both. By the way, they were both Mormons in the Mormon Church, but they didn't act very Mormon like many of their friends said. And quite frankly, were kind of a very free spirited, very narcissistic couple essentially. But but Barry had this issue about the IRS, and he he didn't want to pay any taxes. Didn't think he thought the IRS was a criminal organization and had no right to his tax money, so he didn't pay it. Um, and then he ended up at some point one year, uh, he ended up one year in prison for not paying. And he, he was, I don't think he's still fighting them. And I don't entirely disagree with some of his concepts on the IRS, but, <laughs> you know, but um, I don't know. I don't want to go to a prison. So I pay my taxes. So IRS, I'm paying my taxes. Just let you know, guys, in case you're watching, I'm paying the taxes. I just don't like it, but I'm paying the taxes. You bunch of thieves. But anyway, <laughs> and then we have this picture, which shows four kids. It shows Adam Cox, Alex Cox, Lori Vallow, and Summer Cox. Summer was the sister, the, the one who was there with, with uh, Janice, the mom, and that conversation said that Lori was the most wonderful child ever to walk the face of the earth. She's the most beautiful, beautiful person. Um, Alex is the one, her brother that ended up killing everybody and kill, then killing himself, in my opinion. And then Adam Cox, Adam Cox was actually the brother that seemed to escape being a horrible human being. And uh, he was actually the one that, uh, Lori's husband, Charles Vallow, reached out to to say, hey, please help me do because the rest of your family is insane. And I think she's trying to, I think Lori's crazy and I don't know what the hell to do. And so Adam was actually kind of a helper. But that is not her entire family. Okay, so let me pull up, I'll pull up this um, family diagram here. And this is funny because it's written like this. <laughs> and I'm like, I first looked and said, well, who, who made up this silly little diagram? But then I'm like, OK, this is a pretty good little diagram, actually, because it'll make things clear as I go through some of her history. OK, this is 
Janice the mom, and that's Barry the dad. They had these five children, and I believe there was one more, a, I think a baby that died. Um, so I think there's one more that died young or something. Anyway, what you see, what you just saw was Lori, Alex, and Adam, and Summer. What happened to Stacy? You ask what happened to Stacy? Let me just tell you what happened to Stacy. Stacy married this fella, this guy named Cope, and she had this weird eating disorder, and and she started having some really strange concepts. And she, then they separated and she she went away with the child, their daughter and her daughter then started saying she was a boy when she was three years old and had her hair cut and all, all kinds of things were going on. He tried to get custody back of the kids. Um, that, that daughter, by the way, ended up uh, being part of the, part of the day bill culty thing. Um, but she stopped, she's had all this eating disorder. So anyway, she ended up, the family, she ended up staying back with her family and her, the parents went off to Hawaii as they love to do and desert the children. And Alex was, was with her when she pretty much died. <laughs> so Alex is there again when somebody dies. So I'm not saying he killed that sister, but Alex was there. And why did this sister have such a weird, I mean, it wasn't just an eating disorder. It was really off the charts. Like she like was serious. She was very emotionally disturbed. Why is that? Um, so I'm going to say this family wasn't as perfect as people thought. So the rest of this little, little picture here is this is Lori and these are her five husbands. Okay. There they are, the five husbands. Uh, and I'm going to go through the different husbands and you see this one's dead and this one's dead. And then who's two, these two kids are dead. And then over here, she marries Chad, the last husband. He, and then his wife, Tammy is dead. So this kind of a shows you who everybody who died around her, but I'm going to start with just her basic uh, earlier life, I read the book that was put out and I just got some interesting quotes from there. So you can see maybe she wasn't quite what her family's trying to pretend she is. And it's Colby, her son, Colby, the one that's still alive. He is devastated because he said he, he, he you know, he, he has been influenced highly by his mother throughout his life. She, she programmed him, she manipulated him. And in the show and Netflix show, you finally see the realization coming to him that She's not that great a person. <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that when we get to that part of the show. So anyway, all right, let me read you some just basic comments on this family that I pulled out of the book. Lori and her four siblings were raised with an affluence and had the best of everything. And they, they were pretty wealthy. Lori's unconventional parents, Jen, un she had unconventional parents. Janice favored high heels, tight leopard skin pants, short tight tops, bleach blonde hair, and freshly done nails. They would leave all the kids alone and go to Hawaii for the weekend. <laughs> and this is when they weren't that old, mind you. Okay. Which is kind of weird. Um, so they would go to Hawaii for weeks at a time. They gave 16 year old Alex. Okay. The, the killer boy, the, the family hit man. Um, blank checks to buy food for the siblings, putting him in charge of Lori and summer. Alex would cash the check, spending most of the money on himself. He would order pizza and throw parties for his friends. Alex was supposed to look after Summer, but he was always doing something bad. So Lori had to look after Summer. So, okay. Yeah. Um, now, meanwhile, Alex, there's, there's, a, there's a theory that there's something weird going on between Alex and Lori. Alex, the brother of Lori. Alex just gave me the creeps. This is Rose, one of uh, Lori's friends. When Lori and I were in the pool, it was always watching us, and I didn't like that. Okay. Uh, one night when they were in seventh grade, Lori tearfully confided to Rose that Alex wanted to have sex with her. They were sitting on the floor of Lori's bedroom and she suddenly burst into tears, blurting out that her older brother had been making sexual moves on her. We grew up together, so we talked about everything, said Rose. Suddenly, Lori was crying and emotional, and she said to me, Alex is trying to have sex with me. What can I do? The girls fell into each other's arms and hugged and cried. Finally, Rose told Lori that she had no idea what to do. Lori never brought it up again, and Rose never pursued it. Uh... Yeah, uh, there was a lot of theory that something did go on there. And again, we we have to be careful because the friend, Lori, told her, and I want you to understand this about Lori told her friend that Alex wanted to have sex with her. Lori tells a lot of stories. Lori is a absolute pathological liar. She was a pathological liar through a good portion of her life. And once you're a pathological if you're a pathological liar, you're always a pathological liar. It's just that people never caught your pathological lies, you know. So 
I don't know if Alex really did make the moves on her or she just told people that because it got her attention. Um, but there was a weird relationship between the two of them. He was her bitch because he would do anything for her. And I don't know why that was. So maybe Lori put the moves on Alex, not the other way around. Maybe Lori allowed him to do stuff if he just did stuff. He almost seemed infatuated with his sister. So there was a whole weird dynamic there. But Lori, Lori did not run away from her brother, Alex. Lori used her brother, Alex, for the rest of her life until he killed himself. So there you go. Anyway, turns out, let's see. She was very popular and had lots of friends. There's a lot of what Al Lori has that attracts people to her. That's a, a, that's from her, Adam, the brother. She's a very pretty girl. And she was, if you list, if you go to Netflix and listen to what she says, she's a very girly and she's always very cheerful and happy like this. You know what I mean? Um, so she's like, oh my gosh, yes, that's true. Oh my God, I, I do like doing that. So she's like that all the time. So she has developed a persona that makes people think she's sweet and innocent. And she's one of those. I thought she was just a Barbie doll. So there you go. She was playing the part of a Barbie doll. Um, Nelson, who came from, I don't know, I forgot who Nelson was. Nelson, who came from a, a wealthy family, was not Mormon, soon met Lori's unconventional parents and remembered them as a different kind of family. She, uh, so then the Lori that Rose grew up with changed. She bleached her hair, started wearing skimpy clothes. She started getting her nails done, wore red lipstick. She was all about the social circle of flashy cars and flashy clothes. That wasn't the Lori I grew up with. So by the time she got to be a teenager, she just had changed a lot. Um, and, and this is happens when you talk about psychopathy. Um, the, it isn't that they weren't psychopaths to begin with. And in a, in a family with these whack jobs as parents who, who left their children unattended, I'm going to say there probably was detachment disorder issues with a lot of these kids where they weren't getting the kind of attention and love you should get from your parents. So that helps develop psychopathy. But a lot of times you don't see the psychopathy as uh, come into play until you become, have more power. As a teenager, you start getting more power. When you get a car, when you get money, when you can start dating, that's when it starts happening. Now, serial killers often don't do anything until the teenagers because they can't. They might burn down a shed in the backyard and kill the cat. But, you know, as far as killing off people, although it is happening younger and younger these days, um, you know, they usually, it's usually the teenage years that they can, kicks in, the power starts kicking in. Um, then let's see. Um, the Melanie, that's the daughter of the dead Stacy, said, Lori used to carry me around as a little baby and pretend that I was hers when she was 16. So she was like, she said, like, oh, a fantasy. So she's pretending she was hers. You wonder about the fantasy thing there again. Then there was one of her friends was murdered. Yeah, somebody else was murdered and the back of a car. And supposedly she was there, but then somebody said she was not there. So it was, there's an interesting thing about that. Anyway, let's go further. Let's see. Um, she became a cheerleader. Now all eyes were on her. And then in 1992, against her parents' wishes, Laura, Lori eloped to Las Vegas with Nelson. That's the first boyfriend, the first husband. All right. None of the Cox family nor any of Lori's friends attended the wedding. And, and the parents never attended her weddings. <laughs> I think the parents were so narcissistic themselves they could care less about bothering. Um, the marriage was short-lived. She said she was going to get a divorce from Nelson and that she was moving, but she didn't know where to. Now, listen, start the claims here. She claimed Nelson was beating her up, but I don't know if that was true or not. Oh, my God, did she did she make claims against Nelson? She called the police. She took, All kinds of claims were going on there. Again, she's claiming, and we don't know that, we never get to hear that other person, you know, whether it really happened or not. So people are believing what she tells them. Adam's fiance, this is Adam, this is the brother that's half sane, or maybe, Adam, maybe you're totally sane, and I don't know how you did it. Uh, Nicole met Lori in Austin soon after she arrived. Nicole found her future sister-in-law beautiful, outgoing, but constantly craving attention. She probably looked in the mirror more than anyone I know, she said. And it was a running joke in the family. She loved to look at herself and always had drama in her life. See, high level of narcissism right there. That is part of psychopathy. Uh, it's all about her and nobody else. She has to get the massive attention or her life is interesting enough and exciting enough and grandiose enough. Um, Lori started then after this marriage ended, she started dating William Lug. 
whatever that name is, William, um, who was a year older than her. It was a tempestuous relationship. And for the next couple of years, they periodically lived together. Okay, again, she couldn't get along with this dude. Now she can't get along with this dude. Either she can't pick men or she drives them insane. Um, and considering the fact that she is a manipulative, in my opinion, a manipulative spider, I believe a black widow type of spider <laughs> that who knows what she drove them to, what she caused them to do, what she claimed they did that they didn't even do. All right. So then at one point uh, in 1995, Travis County Deputy Sheriff Michael somebody uh, met with Lori, who claimed that William had hit her in the mouth and thrown her on the bed, injuring her. We did observe, observe injury to Lori Cox, he wrote in the support report. Her upper lip did have a small cut on the inside of the mouth. He was charged with assault, but the case was later dismissed because the victim, Lori, failed to show up in court. Okay, so did he really do that or did she just punch her own self and then blame it on him? I don't know. Now, uh, Stacy, I think that the, the, the dead wife of the Cope guy said she always admitted to me and others that her family was a psychological hornet's nest. And that's and Stacy would say terribly emotionally disturbed. Um, Melanie, that was her daughter that had to take, ended up being the caretaker for her mother, believing she is responsible and sacrifices her childhood caring for her mother because her mother was such a mess. Um, a couple of days, this is back going back to the, the, the Cope sister that they just left out of the documentary. Cope brought Stacy and Melanie back to Washington to live with him. And three months, uh, for three months, Melanie lived with her grandparents' house. And had, that had changed her beyond recognition. Oh, oh, I didn't realize that. So Melanie, the daughter of Stacy, who ended up joining the cult later, and I think they tried, helped try to kill her husband. Uh, so she was with her grandparents, these crazy people, when she became, and she started, cut, cut her hair short with scissors, saw, saw, believe she was a three-year-old boy. I think she wasn't even three. Um, and we started wearing baseball hats like her uncle Alex. Oh, this is Something weird has happened to Melanie, wrote her father. She insists she's a boy, and upon meeting new people, she insists, call me AJ, Alex, or Bobby, and I'm three years old. And her voice started changing. Now, she turned out to be a girl later, but you know. And so he filed for, for custody of her um, because of the craziness of the family. Uh, so now, let's go back to Lori. Now she's married to this dude here. She gets pregnant with Colby, okay? Now, Lori's still using her maiden name, Cox, in 1996. By the way, she, she marries within two to three years, like two years, three years, two years, three years. I mean, she doesn't wait long to get a new husband. Still using her maiden name, Cox, swore an affidavit against her new husband. She accused him of mentally and physically abusing her over the last three years. See? So he's abused. So wait a minute. Everybody abuses her, apparently. Um, even though she's this little Barbie doll. And so sweet and so giving and so kind and so wonderful. But she gets beat up by everybody. All right. And stated that William had threatened to kill her and their unborn child if she dared call the police on him again. William has beat me up, claimed Lori, hitting and pushing me and holding the phone away so I couldn't dial 911. She added that William had warned her that if he went to jail, he would find her and kill her no matter how long it took. Once again, the case was dismissed against that guy in court. All right. She, then she gave birth to a boy named Colby. Um, she wrote later, uh, let's see. And she, this is what she said of her, that husband, husband number two, the father of Colby. William is void of any light and intelligence to know the difference between right and wrong. I think she's looking in a mirror, um, wrote Lori. They believe they can lie and cheat and conspire to evil. Mirror, Lori. Without any consequences. Mirror, Lori. Obviously, and this is where, you know, you, you see yourself and other people, but claim that they're what you are, right? Uh, obviously, I'm filing for a divorce immediately. I also plan to file civil charges. For the next few years, Lori and Colby were constantly on the move, living in numerous places as Lori struggled to survive as a hairstylist. She drifted from job to job in a rootless existence. She doted on her little son, who represented the only permanence in his life, her life. Later, Colby would remember his early days with his mother as she floundered. He had to grow up fast and become used to picking up his things and moving at the drop of a hat. He always felt protective of Lori, who treated him more as a best friend than a son. I'm going to guarantee that. So poor Colby. And when you watch him on Netflix show, he just seems like a really nice guy. And I believe his mother, he ended up do, taking care of his mother more than she of him. She didn't do her job as a mother. Like everybody says she was such a good mother. No, she wasn't. She sucked as a mother. She, she married over and over again. She dumped her husbands. 
She was in supposedly violent relationships, constantly calling the police, uh, making accusations. That's not a healthy environment to raise children in. So I'm going to say she wasn't a good mother. And, and But she told them she was a good mother. And this is why I think she manipulated her kids by saying, I love you. I'm a good mother to you. And you grow up with your narcissistic or psychopathic mother telling you that she is wonderful. You, you, you feel you have to believe it. And I believe she did that to, to all these kids because like Tylee, it looked like many people said Tylee, her daughter, seemed to revere her tremendously and, and want to please her all the time. Well, probably because she's being manipulated, you know? Um, so then, let's see, uh, it goes on. Um, so in May of 1998, Barry and Janice Cox took Lori, her sister Summer, and Colby on a family vacation to Hawaii. Oh, this is when Alex stayed with the, the ailing sister, Stacy, and she died. <laughs> so, okay, we'll skip more on that. So Stacy's dead now. Okay. Um, now, let's see. Um, then Lori's father goes to prison for a year. Okay, then let's see. Lori and Colby moved to Driftwood, Texas, 25 miles west, and she starts dating a 43-year-old successful business analyst named Joe Ryan. Okay, this is husband number three who has quite a lot of money. She always wanted a guy with a lot of money. So he was pretty well off and had a beautiful home and all that stuff. For Lori, who had been struggling to find her footing for years, the tall, handsome Ryan offered a lifeline for her and Colby to finally get some stability. All right. In the show, it's interesting, a Netflix show, Colby will say, he, she really it was very sweet in the beginning. He was such a sweet guy. And then later he stays, he, then he's later he said that he became abusive and started punching him. And then later he claims that he was sexually abused by him. Again, I see Lori behind all of this, all of this, all of these claims. Um, so uh, let's see. It, yeah, later. The, okay, so then we got this. Okay, so after they were married, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, so she's married to him, and then they have a child named that that was Tylee. And Colby loved his little sister. He just adored his little sister. So they were he, you know, sad for Colby again. He Colby really got the worst end of all of this. So then let's say they got they're in the oh, they have a big huge home, 4,400 square foot home, and all this kind of stuff. And then Lori was still doing weird things like dyeing her baby's hair. Uh -huh, okay. Um, and let's see. Then, mm -mm -mm, okay. So at this point was when there was claimed that uh, Lori started doing having a special room where she would dance around in front of a mirror and to her religious music and her favorite 80s songs. And that was her form of meditation and getting closer to God. I think the mirror thing is kind of funny. <laughs> Remember, she loved to look at herself in a mirror. So she wanted to see how beautiful she was. And she was dancing in front of a mirror and all this stuff. Like, that's massive narcissism. All right. Then she claimed now that Tylee was the reincarnation of her dead sister, Stacy. And that spirits from behind the veil were giving Lori instructions on every aspect of her life. So you see, she was already into this kind of ideation before she even met Chad Daybell. So don't blame Chad on everything. Um, and then since she moved, married Joe Ryan, she moved away from the Mormon, basic Mormon religion. Then she went on. Okay. So now she, she wanted more attention. So she ends up, she goes on wheel of fortune. There she is on wheel of fortune. There she is on wheel of fortune. And they asked her like, are you a hairdresser? Yes. And I'm the best. And you know, and she, she's very like, really arrogant on that show, in my opinion. And she did that. And then she went into Mrs. Hayes County beauty pageant. Yes, she did. She's on the beauty pageant now, running around in her bathing suit. And she's being cowgirl. And this is her. She Here she is with her husband at the time. And she at the time, she says <laughs> that when they asked her questions about everything, she's like, oh, we have this, my, my, my husband Joe's at home with the kids and we're the most happy couple. And she died, left him like a week later. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so she divorces him. Uh, then she files for bankruptcy, owing almost $724,000 to creditors. And she tells the bankruptcy court she needs at least $6,200 a month for basic living expenses, including $500 for food. According to her filing, she's now paying $1,900 a month for a newly rented apartment where she lives in Austin, Texas with Colby and Tyler, uh, Tylee, sorry. 
Uh, and then they owe tons of taxes. I guess she's just like her daddy. She didn't like paying taxes. Um, she had $17,000 in credit card debt. She was earning $41,000 a year. Uh, so, yeah. So <laughs> she likes spending money. And that's important because she likes money. She likes a fanciness in her life. Okay, time for husband number four. Poor Charlie, Charles Vallow, who I think sounded like a super great guy. I mean, he sounded like the nicest man in the world. And she, and he didn't sound very bad either. Till apparently, supposedly, he did all these things. He ends up dead, by the way, because she destroyed his life. She destroyed his life after she married him. Then she denied him the right to see his daughter. She did all kinds of nasty things to prevent him from being around her, claiming all kinds of sexual abuse, um, claiming he raped both their children. I mean, it, it, none of it ever proven. Um, she destroyed him until finally he just uh, ended up drinking too much and dying from just probably severe depression. Um, that, but she marries Charles Vallow. Who is Charles Vallow? He's 49 years old. He walks in for a haircut. Handsome guy, financial planner, expensively tailored suit. He was smitten right away. They looked like they were made to be together. He was handsome. She is handsome. You know what I mean? So anyway, um, I'm going to skip that. Okay, so let's see. Da, 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 da. So Charles and Lori settled down in a big house with a pool near Austin. His, he, had, he, can't, he was a divorced guy, so his, his sons came and visited and all that stuff. And he converted to the to Mormonism, Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. He converted and was active in her church. Great guy, right? She's he going along with his wife. Lori, because she pretty much, I think, always called the shots. So that's why I'm saying even Chad Daybell, sketchy as he was, Lori was not any kind of victim. She loved the lavish new lifestyle Charles provided. There were big cars, big designer, best designer clothes, and expensive vacations, all the things she had grown up with and then lost. And Charles ensured that Laura had a special dancing room with mirrors <laughs> and her own personal refuge to convene with the spirits. <laughs> the only spirit she was convening with was her own narcissistic brain, but hey. <laughs> oh my God. Um, uh, on August 20, 2006, the lawyer called the Hayes County Sheriff's Office to report that Joe Ryan, now she's reporting that Joe Ryan has uh, abused Colby and, and Tyler during the marriage. And then they, 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 um, they, they interviewed Ty, Ty Lee and she never actually, she said, no, he didn't do it. So that kind of all dropped. Just the whole thing, just really sketchy. And she also claimed that she discovered uh, gay porn on his computer, which was never proven either. So you see, she just claims all kinds of crap. She said she had no idea that her husband was gay and preferred men. Well, if that's true, why was he raping her two-year-old daughter at the time or three years old or whatever she was? She, uh, so she had all these allegations. They filed a motion, blah, blah, blah. So this whole custody battle that went on forever and ever and ever. Um, so mostly she violated all the orders. But anyway, let's go on here. Now Alex is living in Phoenix. That's that's the, 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 the family hitman. He's now there. He's local. Um, let's see. Uh, what happened next? Okay. I mean, I mean it's, it, is, it is unbelievable the amount of stuff that happened. Now, your therapist, the problem with the therapist is they, most of the therapists fell, fell for anything Lori said. They really liked her. They thought she was open and, and honest. <laughs> okay. But this therapist did say she caught Lori coaching her daughter to make damaging accusations against her ex-husband. But then another therapist wrote, Lori genuinely believes Tylee was in danger, noticing that her belief system was riddled with ghosts and fanatical religious dogma. So, see, Lori could put on whatever she wanted to put on, but sometimes... Some people caught her in it. Some people did. So then we got, oh, let's see. So then, oh my God, so I think it's very, very, okay. I'm trying to get to the point where she goes after her next husband yet. Yeah. Oh yeah. So then Alex Cox goes up because Laura tells him to and shoots him in the balls with a, with a paint gun. Um, I mean, no, no, she, no, he tased him, tased him. Uh, and then said he was going to kill him. So that's the first thing Alex did. And then he, he ran off. And so anyway, oh, my God, it just, let's see. Yeah. She used to walk around the house in a bikini in front of her kids all the time. Okay, all kinds of weird things. Um, yeah. There's so much I can't possibly go into. You, have to, you can buy the book if you want to read all the details of her very interesting uh, life. So then we get to the point where, she basically gets bored with Charles and she she's she's done with that at that point. And she's now hooked up with with Chad and they're having this a little affair. 
And um, so at the point that she's doing that, then, then it's time to get rid of Charles. So she makes all these accusations to, get, uh, to the police about Charles, that he's 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 uh, abusing her and blah, blah, blah. The same kind of crap she's done with everybody else. And then eventually Charles comes back and he's trying to save his kids. And Alex comes into their home and um, and shoots, shoots Charles and kills him. Um, and they, when they interview, the interviews are interesting because Alex is not all bent out of shape about the fact he killed his brother-in-law. And then Lori isn't all bent out of shape either. And the interesting thing is their stories don't match. So so Alex basically said that they were all there and then then uh, Lori and Tylee left. And then then Charles came after Adam with a bat and he shot him. And then when, when the police get finally catch up with Lori after she takes the kids to school and buys hamburgers and stuff um, and catch up, she comes back, she, she, they talk to uh, uh, Lori and Tylee, I guess they were dropping JJ off at school. And then she, she admits to being in the house. So her, her story is completely different from her brother. She says she was in the house and Tylee said, yeah, I was there too. And I picked up this bat and tried to separate them. And then, then Charles took the bat away. My stepfather took the bat away. And then he tried to hit Alex and then Alex shot him. And then later on, they found that one of the bullets seemed to be like a shot straight down after he was already on the floor. <laughs> so that's when they get a little suspicious, but that didn't come until later. So Charles is dead. She meets Chad and then Mel and then Ch then Melanie dies. Um, the suspicious death. And then two weeks later, off they go married. And, and, and then the kids go missing. And then Alex, the kids, we, it is believed that Alex killed, killed the kids and then killed himself. I think he thought the police were on to him and he would have to confess and maybe have to bring us. He was trying to protect us. His, he fell on the sword for his, his sister, who is uh, obviously that guy is mentally, he is mentally off. Um, and Lori took advantage of him. Um, so I'm going to say, let's go back and take a look at that psychopathic checklist here. She was very glib, very glib about things. She, she rarely, she, she, she would like, Oh, let me show you some glibness. Uh, I can show you some glibness because this came from, uh, let's see if I can find it here, what her, what she said to people. Um, is this it? Oh, oh, I never meant to cause you any kind of pain of any kind. I'm fully sorry you don't, I'm sorry you don't really fully understand the situation. She's telling this to Colby. Um, I've done everything to protect them. Sure you did. Um, their whole lives, as you know. And he says at the end, it was just, to listen to her actually try to flip the script is unbelievable. So when he confronted her, she would just, oh, that, oh, that. I didn't do that. You just don't understand. Of course I love you. She's very, very glib about everything. And what, what she has very little, what's the next thing? Um, okay, let's look at the next one. Grandiose sense of self-worth. Well, yes, she always thought she, she should have everything. She was beautiful. She should be rich and she should be a goddess. And that's why she hooked up with Chad. So she could be at the top of the pyramid, right? Need for stimulation, proneness to boredom. Oh my God. She definitely needed stimulation. She liked to spend a ton of money. She liked to go places. She liked to travel, you know, just do all this fun stuff. She traded husbands probably because she got bored with them all. Clearly a pathological liar. She was very manipulative. She never showed any remorse or guilt. As a matter of fact, when you even see her in court, this 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 one picture of her in court. Let's see if I'm fine. Oh, this one, this one. Look at this one. <laughs> she's just smiling at everybody. And they said when she's in prison, let's see. Well, I saw a thing about her being in prison here. Where is that one? No, 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 no. Where is it? Okay, hold on a second. Uh, eh, 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 eh. Oh, Lori was given her own private cell and allowed out into the pod to relax, watch television, read books, and make phone calls. She appeared to relish all the media attention and carefully monitored coverage of her case on the news. She was totally aware of it all, said the inmate. She knew she was the main story, and she liked it. Yeah, she sure did, because she is a massive narcissist. So then we go on. Shallow effect, she definitely had all that. She, when she was talking to the police, she just laughed things off. Like, oh, her husband was just... Charles was just murdered and she was already making jokes in the police station. Um, callous. There you go. Lack of empathy. Had none. Parasitic lifestyle. You betcha. She glommed on to any man who had more, had the money she wanted. And as soon as she didn't get what she wanted from them, she was a parasite and glommed on to somebody else. Promiscuous sexual behavior. I'm going to say maybe she and her, her, her brother did have a little something going. Early behavioral problems. Oh yeah. The family said she didn't have any, but I'm seeing she did. A lack of realistic long-term goals. Well, I, I think uh, 
in spite of the fact, uh, and Dr. Grandy pointed this out rightly, in spite of the fact that she and her husband were supposed to be like dealing with the end of the world in like a month or two, they were off in Hawaii renting a house. So <laughs> she was just doing whatever she wanted to because a, because 14, she's impulsive and she was irresponsible. She didn't take care of her children properly. She would, you know, all the things she did were very irresponsible. Uh, 16, failure to accept responsibility for her own actions. She said that to her own son. It's not my fault. 17, many short-term marital relationships. Well, you got that one right. Juvenile delinquency. She didn't have that, um, that we know of, that she got nailed for. Uh, and then the 19, of course, we don't know. Criminal versatility. Boy, she was versatile, in my opinion. She had all kinds of ways to get what she wanted. She went after their money. She got them killed. <laughs> you know, she lied to the police. She was versatile on that. I'm going to say out of that checklist, which is a very a long checklist, she's got almost all of those suckers. Um, uh, and I always say about psychopaths, you can tell a psychopath because you're going to either be useful or in the way. So when her husband was useful, she kept them. When they were in the way, she got rid of them. When her kids were useful, she kept them. When they were in the way, she got rid of them. That's the way they, that's the way they work. And I want to go to Molly now. Molly said that Molly, who I hope is still here. Um, then I'm going to go to your comments after this. Molly said this before I did the show. Pat, you may have already come across the blog, True Crime Arizona, Lori Vallow's Deadly Delusions. I have not, I have not seen that because I came, I didn't get a chance to, but again, she didn't have any delusions. If not, there is a lot of good information in the blog, including Lori talking to the police. She sounds like a glib, pathological liar. Yes, she does, Molly, you're correct there, who somehow fooled her mother and sister. Yes, she did. And her brothers and her kids until her kids turned up dead in Idaho. And then they went, oh, maybe we were wrong. Um, looks to me like she used her guile and hid behind crazy religious beliefs beliefs to all offload everyone that was in her way of her being with Chad and living the life she wanted. I think she used the religion to get what she wanted. I don't believe for a minute she was deluded into anything that she believed that people were zombies or any of that bull crap. I believe she thought this was great stuff that she could use to, to raise her own self above other people, to feel great about herself, to get Chad, because he at that point Chad was popular at that point, okay? And if she got rid of her husband, she, she thought she was going to get a million dollars at least. She ended up with 4000 a month, which is still good. But she got rid of her husband, and he got rid of his wife. Then the two of them together would have even more money and be able to build an even bigger empire. So she was really into that. But I think it wasn't because she was deluded into believing things that were crazy, and therefore she couldn't make proper choices. She knew exactly what she was doing, and she used that religion that Chad had developed. Um, and she told that to people. She told people what they want, what, what would work to get them to cooperate or get out of her way. If not for having a stupid brother, <laughs> well, yeah, he wasn't the brightest, who made mistakes when he murdered her husband. He was like, probably, well, yeah, Alex was not that good at being too clever. He, he screwed up enough. And also she did, and so did Chad. None of them were smart. They really weren't. Um, and her leaving so many incriminating emails and texts, you bet she left like a boatload of, of emails and texts behind. Then the question, so I wanna comment right here, Molly, you nailed it, you're right, you're a good profiler, congratulations. I, I think you're, you're correct. That, she's a absolute 100% psychopath. Um, now you, the question you ask is, at the end is, do you think she would have gone on eventually to kill Chad for the next big attraction? Yes. I absolutely think Chad would have ended up dead at some point. She is a black widow, in my opinion. Um, and, and, and she, she, even if she didn't do, uh, even if she killed off her children as well, she, she still, in my opinion, uh, comes under the black widow category. So, yes, I think that she was way more dangerous than even Chad. Chad managed to get his little following. And I think he probably wouldn't have killed his wife if it hadn't been for her. He probably did all of her bidding because now he had what he considered a gorgeous woman. His wife was at that point in life, probably your average, average lady and midlife lady. She wasn't a beauty. She was just an average midlife lady. Um, and she, although she was also in her midlife was, and this isn't the greatest picture of her, but she was still into 
hair, nails, being girly, girly, being all sexy and stuff, super sexy. I think the pictures on the beach, she looked very attractive. So, you know, he probably fell, fell for her like a, like crazy because he's a midlife crisis. He's, he's now gotten his little following. He's all, his ego's getting all pumped up. And then he, this woman wants him and she wanted him because he would give her at that point what she wanted. And it worked out for her until she, they got caught. So if they hadn't been caught, the money would have run out and she would have gotten annoyed with Chad at some point and she would have moved on. And God knows that she would probably make sure that there was an insurance policy on him before he died in his sleep <laughs> because Alex wasn't around to shoot him. So I'm, I'm going to say maybe he might've gotten poisoned, but so I think, yes, I think he would have been next. Now it's interesting. Let me talk about the trial before I go to your comments. The trial is coming up and it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Some people think Chad is already turning on her and starting to blame her. I think she's going to turn and blame him like he wouldn't believe. And then I think they're both going to blame Alex because they're being charged with, you know, murder, uh, conspiracy and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but I think they're, if they get good lawyers and a stupid jury, um, I think they can offload the murders on Alex. Alex is not around to say anything, but it's pretty well presumed at least I think she can get away with it more than uh, Chad can because her ex-husband Charles and her two kids were killed by Alex, as far as we know. Uh, and I think that's probably true under her direction, mind you, but killed by Alex. Um, now, he's not a hired hit. So you have to go with conspiracy. In other words, uh, that they all together plan the death of her husband and plan the death of the kids. And then they used him to be the, the executioner. So they really got to push the conspiracy issue because she didn't actually physically murder them. So she can say, I didn't kill them. My, my brother was a little crazy. I went to, you know, when we were there and my, my, my ex acted weird, um, he, he shot him. Um, and I, I didn't think he killed, I didn't, I thought he shot him in self-defense. I personally didn't know anything about him shooting him when he was on the ground. I didn't know that. So I think he, Charles is going to be tricky to even make that a, that she's a, made her brother do that. Um, the two kids, different story because the two kids were totally defenseless and there was no uh, self-defense, you know, thing anybody could say. So that children had to have been killed. The fact that she lied about it to everybody and they end up in the backyard of Chad would indicate a conspiracy and a use of Alex to kill the children. But a, a clever lawyer could, who knows what the clever lawyer can come up with at some point to say she was deluded, that she was under, Ch Ch blame it all on Chad and blame it all on Chad. Chad and Alex worked together to do these things. I was just in love with Chad so much that, that I thought, and I believe the kids were zombies. Chad told me the kids were zombies. So, and she's good at playing games and manipulating. So I think Chad is going to lose more than she's going to lose, but hopefully it will be a good prosecution and a jury won't, won't fall for her, but she's going to play the little, the little uh, victim here. I'm sure when time comes. So let me go to your comments now. Um, uh, let's see. Let's see. I'm, let me, let me roll back up here. Um, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Grande doesn't know Jack, you know, I think Dr. Grande comes from a different point of view. I think he comes from a very therapeutic point of view. He hates calling anybody a psychopath. He's really anti-saying psychopath. He really is. Um, and in this case, I think he, he tends to lean toward delusion. He tends to lean toward more of a, a, a mental issue that the person can't control. Although, you know, and, and I don't know that he knew anything about her previous past life because I don't think he read the book. Um, you know, I don't, I think he does a little less research than I do. Um, before he puts a show out. So you only, if you only know so much, you can only say so much, but you know, I did like his one comment that, you know, deities can't be poor. You know, I think that's pretty cool. That <laughs> made me laugh. That was funny. Um, let's see. Let me, let me roll up here a second. Oh, I'm trying to roll back. Uh, he said, wait a minute. I want to see what this one is. What? Oh, that, wait a minute. Okay. Hold on a second. I gotta go. I gotta go back up here a lot uh, because you have some really great. Um, let's see. All right. Now I'm, I'm back here. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. Sour crime says they're not affected by anything aside from psychopathy and control and greed and power. I'm, I'm go I'll go with that one. I have no problem with that at all. 
Um, Lila says, I once read a simple explanation by a mental health professional about the difference between people with delusional thinking and schizophrenic. And she says, delusional thinkers build castles in the air. Schizophrenics live in them. See, but see, that's, see, I don't like the term delusional because why is it delusional? And, and see, this is the thing. So the concept is that there's, there's three groups. You've got logical thinkers, delusional thinkers, and you've got like schizophrenic thinking. So the schizophrenic thinking is, is delusional and is correct in a sense that actually believes the castle exists. This one is a bit, uh, what, what was this word to, uh, here? Um, that, let me put it up here again build castles in the in the air well the concept that the dilute the person is delusional because they're building something that is unreal they're not it, it's i don't like the word delusional i have a problem with that i do because i don't think it's delusional i think it's it's a it's a it's a choice of a way of viewing the world and i don't know how you can say one person's way of viewing the world is necessarily wrong when and yours is right um, and that's why we get into arguments over so many things that go on in the world, because when it comes down to stuff that can't be absolutely proven, I mean, I can say right now, you know, this is a glass and this has liquid in it, but I can't say what's going to happen in 30 years. I can only have, um, I can use what I consider logic to say, okay, looking at the way the world is going, blah, 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 this is what will happen in 30 years. Um but somebody else will then analyze it and come up with something different. Uh, and you even do that with your own person. You, you might say, I believe I can accomplish this. And here's where the grandiose thinking gets to be problematic too. Because somebody says, I want to be somewhere along the way. Somebody says, I want to be president of the United States. And everybody bursts into laughter who's sitting next to them. And guess what? <laughs> they become president of the United States. I mean, how many of us are actually going to become president of the United States? Is that delusional thinking that you could become president of the United States? Somebody has to become president. So you can have the delu only way it's delusional is that if you already think you are president of the United States and you're not, <laughs> um, or the president is going to call me today when clearly the president doesn't, you don't know the president, you're nobody, you don't work anything to do with the White House and you think the president is about to make a phone call to you. That's delusional. It's usually schizophrenia. Um, uh, but just because you think, just because you say I'm going to become president doesn't mean that you're necessarily delusional. Uh, just because you think you have an afterlife in heaven, are you delusional? Or do you have a system of where you have analyzed the world and you believe there must be life after death and then you're Yes, is it, is it imagination as to what that world looks like? Or are you believing a document that has been written where somebody else has said this is what it looks like? Do you believe it is God's word? I mean, you know, and I don't think it's nice to go around accusing people of being ridiculous and wrong because they have, they have, um, uh, and you can call it a belief or you can call it hope or you can call it an assessment, whatever you want. So I get, I, when it comes to psychopathy, that's entirely different, you know. So she wasn't delusional in the sense that she believed in something that she had truly had no clue. She really believed something that, that she, let's say, for example, said she absolutely thought that her husband was actually not her husband, that it was a truly a zombie inside of Charles. And I believe absolutely she knew it was Charles. I mean, I don't believe for a minute she thought there was a zombie in him. So she wasn't deluded. Now, that she wanted to um, espouse a theory uh, that a demonic spirit can take over a person's body. I mean, you know, one can think that. One can think that the way the world is going, there are people who, you know, whatever you can you can you can think that there could be some kind of demonic spirituality in a body you could believe you could believe that you could think that you could postulate that is that a word <laughs> I, always forget, I always forget the fancy words um, <laughs> i think am i making that word up you know you can come up with it but it I, you know getting in somebody's head and deciding whether they 100 believe this and would act on it is entirely different um 
Uh, Lisa says, I like that, Lila. Although the definition would make Chad and Lori schizophrenic, as they certainly lived in their delusions, uh, assuming they really believe them. No, it's schizophrenics. You will know a schizophrenic from a person who's not schizophrenic. Absolutely. Hands down. I can tell all I can. Well, I've, I've mentioned this before in my shows. Somebody writes me a letter. I can read that letter in three seconds flat. I know that person is schizophrenic. And I know if they're not schizophrenic, I have psychopaths who write me and psychopaths who write me always have proper grammar, just most for, mo for the most part, uh, depending on their educational level, always make total sense. Uh, if they if they write to me something that is like totally off the wall and, and it makes zero sense. I'll see if I can, I'll see if I can pull up my my uh, I, I'm not sure when the last time a schizophrenic person wrote me. Um, let's see if I can find it here. It's always fascinating to read. I can, I can just pick up literally any one of them that this particular person has written me. Um, and she's written me hundreds of them. Uh, I'm not sure what the last time. Uh, mm, I may not be able to find it because, yeah. Mm, darn. I uh, can't find it right now. But 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 when when she writes, I mean, nothing, absolutely nothing makes any sense whatsoever. Just uh, total, total garble. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I'll just, I'll just read. I'll just read. I'll just read one of them. Okay. Let's see. Let me, let me find one of her. Okay. Um, but let's make sure this isn't it. Far from the shallows. Oh my. Are we? When we read about the Ephianis. Here, this is fun, a mockery. I'll bite. We are essentially in flight, yet here, grounded. And I privately like people to agree, okay, how do I feel before mockery? When do I, when do, I do civil service before laughing at those who don't need airspace outside of epiphanies? Well, we all have them, marriages, children, aging, sure. We are not comedy. Yet we don't leave Earth's landing ground for the... <laughs> Every one of hers is like that. It goes into all kinds of crazy stuff. She's schizophrenic. I mean, she is deluded because all kinds of ideas are racing through her head and she can't control them. And she can't understand what is, is in her head and what is coming into her head and who's saying things to her. She can't control that. She controlled everything. And so did Chad. They knew exactly what they were doing. They are not deluded and schizophrenic in any way, shape, or, or form. Um, so uh, the zombie thing doesn't mesh with their personal histories. Well, the zombie thing is, is useful. Remember, useful or in the way type of things. Okay, so they had these, Chad had all these ideas, and then at some point he decided to bring zombies into the picture because now he's trying to separate us from them, making us more important than them, and why we should leave them and have just us. So then he started doing dark and light. And then when people became problematic, like he wanted her and wanted, did not want her husband or her children, then he started giving gradations of dark and light. And when you get too dark, you see, then you become a zombie. And, and then you just keep making up crap. You know what I mean? You make up crap. And you can, you know, and that's how these, these crazy books get written and people read them and say, oh my God, you know, this is so interesting. It's most of it's crap, but it's interesting. And, and it, it gives you... It's like playing a fantasy game. It really is very much a fantasy game. When people get involved in fantasy games, um, they're, they're fun in the sense that you get the feeling of it yourself. You know, if I say, okay, I'm going to play a fantasy game and I'm going to be the queen of the, 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 um, the dark realms, you know. And so now I'm, now I'm typing away about, oh, you know, I'm Pat the powerful, Pat the powerful. And I envision myself in a way. And then I start writing what my likes and dislikes are. I start playing a part. It's like being in a movie and you develop this movie for you and all your friends and, 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 a, and a big, huge, big, huge game. And when everybody plays your game, you have fun and everybody has their part, especially the people who are the producers who are the manipulators and are usually the king and queen or something like that. And this happens in so many different I mean, in a sense, we have games being played in offices. We have games being played in politics. We have games being played in sororities and fraternities and, and things like that. There are games that are played um, and people have power and people do not have power. And there's leaders and followers, but people like being a part of things. And so the zombie thing, I think, came in when he decided, you know, 
and she decided together they both needed to get rid of because she was talking she uh, the people they didn't like and instead of just saying you know i don't like this person so i'm just going to divorce them i'm going to have to deal with them the idea was especially when they came with money you see the money was very useful i can get rid of them and get all their money so i retain all the control and all the finances so very useful um uh <laughs> <laughs> Martin says that's a list of my best traits. <laughs> oh, Martin's a psychopath. I didn't know, Martin. <laughs> oh dear. When you when you start seeing this in your family and in your uh your your exes, uh that's unfortunate. <laughs> Let's see. Um oh, this is interesting. Wait, wait a minute, where is it? Um Lila says, yeah, Bundy's mom said the same thing. I know my son and he just couldn't have done it. Yeah. And, and often families are suckers. They are. And they're often used because, especially the females, the females are used more than the males, by the way, except Alex in this case had a thing for his sis. But, you know, the, the men use the females that, and the, as a place to stay, to get money from, to borrow their vehicles, to go kill people with. You know, they use the females. And, and women have soft hearts sometimes for stuff and they don't see the nonsense sometimes a man will go a um, uh, father will go yeah you're full of crap buddy get out of my house the woman don't, don't send him away you know he's trying you know whatever and she wants to give her little boy another chance and another chance and another chance and in this case i think the same thing i think she played them with a sweet voice and all this kind of stuff and i'm going to say if we actually knew what she was all of the all of her life we would find a thousand examples but the family they're I think the parents are so narcissistic they didn't pay any attention anyway. And uh, she just probably played them. And as long as they got what they want, they probably didn't care. So um, let's see uh, what else we have here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I'm late. Well, yeah, at this point, uh, I'm going to start your show from the beginning. That's a good idea. Uh, always a little tricky and to do it later. Um, <laughs> and says Chad was thinking with his private parts because Lori was a blonde, attractive woman, and Lori is a and Lori is a monster. She was, but not to Chad. You see, because again, ma manipulators know what they want. And Black Widows, by the way, uh, this is an example I always give for Black Widows. So the ones that go on, you know, online, internet, or whatever, and they say they're looking for this guy. I'm looking for a, an honest man. I'm looking for a hardworking man who would love to have a. Uh, a loving, a loving woman. And I love football and dogs. And I like to cook for my man and I love sex, <laughs> you know, and every guy's going, that's me. I want that. <laughs> that's I'm that guy. And I want that. And like, she, like, she's not going to tell him things that are going to make him go, Oh, I don't want to deal with that mess. She gives him exactly what he wants. She moves in. She does exactly those things in the beginning. And then she kills him. Once she gets the money, then he's, he's, he's a goner. So, I'm sure she knew how to play the most. I love you. I love you. I love. I don't even know. She's psychopathic. Do I think she was in love with Chad? I doubt it. I really doubt it. I think she was enamored by what she could get from him. And I think he was enamored by what he could get from her, which was to be proud that he got himself a looker. Um, and he, the funny thing is neither one of them have any understanding of how other people see them because getting married two weeks after his wife died and got killed, but he was trying to say he was broken hearted that his wife was dead. And two weeks later, he's married to somebody else, you know, <laughs> come on now. <laughs> now let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Robin says, Alex's first wife said that Lori and Alex had an inappropriate relationship. May have been the reason she divorced Alex. Yeah. She claimed they had that. I, I can't prove it's true. She said she thought so. Um, the forensic psychologist Netflix show has a number. Uh, he didn't say too much. If that's if that's the guy in the chair, I can't quite remember. But good. <laughs> um, Carolina says the day Alex shot Charles Vallow, Lori was giggling with the police, and she gave a pool party that night. Oh, I forgot about the pool party. Yeah, you know, my husband's dead. You want to come over? <laughs> we're all we're gonna have a barbecue. You know, <laughs> I want to be seen in my bikini. Uh, yeah, she had a pool party that night. Oh, and. Let me see if I can find this. That she's. This is another interesting thing. That after he got killed, let's see if I can find it. Oh, 
I, I, I took so many pictures, uh, copied so many things. And then I, since I copied so many, I couldn't get control of them. Um, trying to find the one where, oh crap. Um, essentially, oh, dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it, dang it. Oh, maybe it's here. Hold on a second. Aha. No, that's not it. Oh, this is funny. This is the one Chad said. Right, let's, 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 Chad said to her, he sent her this email. The short version is that she's been switched. Timmy is in limbo and in level three demonic entity named Viola is in her body. It happened about 10 p.m. And then he goes, I'm eager to see see you soon. Try to, trying to hasten her departure. <laughs> I sure did. I love you endlessly. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I'm not trying to find the one that she sent to. Is it? Wait a minute. That's not this one. Oh, that's the pain one. No, I don't want that one. I want. No, oh, I don't want that one. Oh, where'd it go? Maybe I forgot to pull it over. Um, essentially, what she did was she said, so after, after, after uh, Charles was killed, she, she uh, sent an email, an email to the, his kids and one of the kids and said, oh, by the way, your dad passed away. Um, and sorry about that. And then he's like, what, what, what are you talking about? What, what, what happened? And then she said, oh, you know, I don't know. I'm waiting for the medical examiner. <laughs> he was shot twice. I mean, she didn't need to wait for the medical examiner. And then she just kept ignoring his phone calls. And then, you know, he was, he was super pissed. So, you know, she had no empathy whatsoever for Charles's children at all, at all. And yes, she had a pool party. I forgot about the pool party. Hmm. Uh, okay, so did she kill? No, she did not kill her children. No, and Chad did not kill her children. Alex killed her children. Alex killed her children. As far as we know, he was the one that killed them. And Chad dug the, he, Chad was an ex-grave digger. So he dug the grave and then Chad and Alex killed them and put them in there. Chad, Chad is too wimpy to, kill, I think, to kill off her kids. He might have killed off his wife. Although somebody might have given him something to give his wife, like her. Um, <laughs> Anne says her next husband will be her lawyer. I would not doubt that. You know how often that happens? Isn't that what happened with, um, um, what's her name? <laughs> Sorry. Carla, Carla Homolka. Didn't she, did she marry her lawyer? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, she said, oops, make that Alex. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's Alex. Definitely Alex. Um. But say, except for Tammy, we don't know who did in Tammy. Um, and I don't, yeah, we just don't know. But it seems like Chad was the only one there at the time. So I don't know about that. Um, Caroline says, Pat, can you comment on the weird trial stuff with Judge Boyce? Actually, I have no clue what you're talking about. No idea. Um, is this in this case? I, I, I. I have not read all about the trial coming up. Uh, I have too many other things to do. So, I, you know, you all know way more about the news and you follow my, many more of the cases, uh, you know, actually the trials, which I don't have time for. So I do not know a thing about that. Um, I don't know what they're keeping. If this is this trial you're talking about, I don't know what they're keeping under under wraps or not. So, uh, yes, he is witty. I, li I like some of his wit. I do, I do. And, and sometimes I agree with Dr. Grande. It's just, I think sometimes he takes the, He's, 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 he pussyfoots around a few things. And I, I don't do that because I just tell it like I see it. Um, oh, in the show, they were having a phone call and he kept saying, they're searching the property. He sounded hopeless and she didn't say a word. Um, well, yeah, he knew, that they, he knew the kids were back there. I mean, what basically what happened, as far as I know, is the last time they were seen, they were, Alex was around. So I think what happened was he was to dig the, 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 the graves Alex was to kill them and bring them and put them in there. And then they covered them up. And, and uh, there was, uh, there was also a fire. There was one of them was uh, there was a fire on the property for a long time. So I believe there's no question that Chad was involved in disposing of the two bodies, but there's a difference between uh, denigrating a corpse and killing a person. So Alex will probably get that on him. And then Chad will get the issue about the bodies. Now, Lori can even escape from the body thing because she wasn't a grave digger, right? And it was Chad's house. So she can say, well, I didn't have anything to do with any of that. So Alex killed my kids and he took them away. And then I didn't know what to do. So I just lied to everybody because I was afraid I would be implicated. Yeah, I'm sure the lawyer will come up with some garbage. Um, <laughs> um, so. 
that's an interesting term. I like this one, vanilla psychopaths. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> you know and this is there's a truth that they're violent psychopaths, extremely dangerous psychopaths, and just really annoying psychopaths uh, who just. But you know, even the annoying psychopaths, what you could call a vanilla psychopath, can destroy lives just because they have no concern for anybody else, and they're willing to manipulate and do stuff to them that just um, messes them up completely messes them up, you know? So, um, uh, Lisa says, I agree with you that most beliefs aren't important in themselves, but what Chad Lurie did with that was make the group believe that their spouses and kids weren't human. And that usually leads to bad outcomes. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. It's really hard to know when, when people follow, it is also hard to know do it, if they believe all the things that they're being taught or they just want to be there so much they're willing to go along with it. Or they're perfectly happy to have their spouse be considered a, a you know, to, to be considered a, a, a zombie so they can get rid of their spouse that they're unhappy with. So it's really hard to know whether they also suffer from a narcissistic personality disorder or they're desperate human beings that are terribly, so terribly lonely they'll go with the program no matter what it is. Um, like when you take a Jim Jones issue, why did so many people go with him down to Guyana? You know, just a, why did they do that? You know, what did, what did they believe? Or what, how desperate were they? You know, what was each one of those people are, are different individuals and they all have different reasons for doing that. And in different parts of our lives, we do things for many different reasons. And sometimes when we look back, we go, why the hell did I do that? <laughs> why would I do that? What a, you know, and, and sometimes it's because we're we have some some emotional problem that we're trying to to solve with whatever crazy thing that we're trying to solve it with. Um, uh, Lila says, I do not think Chad and Lori were delusional. I think they simply made up the stuff to benefit themselves. I like that one. That's that's where I come from. Um, and I think the same thing with David Icke. I think that I think he's too smart to actually believe all of the stuff he writes. And of course, what he does, David Icke does, is he tries to say that, I think he's clever to say that there's no, I'm not saying absolutely, but I'm saying this all makes sense. You see, that way you can pretty much say anything and nobody can get you for it, you know? And you can have the fun of developing theories and promoting them. The problem is a lot of people aren't as smart as David Icke are going to believe those things are truths because they, get confused and they start thinking this person knows something I don't because they usually have uh, lower self-esteem and they say they must know something. Um, in the case of uh, Chad and Lori, uh, I don't think they had such low self-esteem that they were just, they, they fell into this quote belief system for that reason. No, I think exactly what you're saying. I think Chad created this world because he started out with fiction and it wasn't quite getting the, the sales he wanted and he, he wanted to be that. I think, I swear to God, I would I have to look up to see if he was a, uh, uh, like an admirer of David Icke, even though David Icke wasn't doing any kind of religious thing like he had, he was doing it. I wonder whether he saw, he saw stuff about him and saw how prominent he became, how famous he became and how many followers he had, um, whether he wanted to be that kind of guy, but I'll do it within the, a Mormon view, a Mormon version of it. And then I'll expand on that and I'll, I'll get my following, which he did, but his following wasn't huge, mind you, because there weren't enough crazy people to follow him. But um, I think he, he started enlarging, enlarging this, the stories because he had to get more and more people in. And, you know, once you start making up your fantasy story, you can, it just rolls, it rolls. And, and being a person who's written fiction, I know how that works. You know, you just get into this uh, stream of consciousness thing and you can just create. Um, so if I wanted to create a, a, my own religion right now, I'm sure I, I can do it. You know, I could do it. I've already got, oh, I've got some followers already, you know, <laughs> and I could, I think I could come up with something that has some plausibility to it, that if I put my heart into it, read, make you think I believe this, then you might start going, oh, you know, Pat Brown is, you know, she's got so many good points. It's called manipulation. But um, Florence says, these narcissistic cult leaders all have to keep their stories interesting. That's a good point. Or their followers will get bored and leave. I doubt Charles Manchin believed much of what he said. Yes, this is also very true because you don't want it to become stagnant. 
you want it to keep going and get more and more interesting and get people more and more like what's coming next. You know, I say it's a big fantasy. It's like it is really like watching a movie or, or a series, more of a series. Like how does a how does a, um, uh, you know, any any kind of a soap opera type thing keep going? Well, they, they, uh, they have to have cliffhangers. They have to have some new a new entity arrives, you know, somebody, the new doctor at the hospital, you know, and then you have to have bad people. You have to have good and evil because it's, otherwise it's dull. So yes, that's what you create and you keep creating and creating and creating. And he kept writing book after book after book and each book gets more and more involved and more and more fascinating. You know, that's how you play the game. Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, Molly, I do not know, uh, the book was the book really skipped and the Netflix and the book completely skipped over Ch Chad's past. So I really don't know. I don't know if I, nobody's ratted him out yet. So I'm curious. Um, I don't know. Uh, their friends were praying for the death of Charles and did nothing when he was actually killed. If they hadn't primed the group by saying he wasn't human, maybe one friend would have said something. Um, Whether they, again, whether they believed that or they were so involved and they felt so sorry for Lori because her husband was a cruel, according to Lori, a cruel, abusive man who was just, who was keeping her from doing, from, from helping Chad. She, he was, he would destroy them all. That makes him a bad person. And, uh, you know, call him a zombie or don't. If he dies, oh, well. And besides, it was an accident, mind you. Not when I'm sorry, not an accident, it was self-defense. When they heard that Charles had died, they thought it was self-defense because Alex said it was self-defense. So there wasn't necessarily a question that, that that they would go to the police and say it wasn't self-defense. So, yeah. Um, yeah, this is very true. Apparently, Chad was talking about his wife dying long before he met Lori. Yeah, he Chad, <laughs> Chad had this idea of this two sides of his life. The first part of his life was with his wife and his five kids. And that would be halfway through his life. And then the second part would be with the spider, <laughs> the spider. And that was the second half of his life. So originally he said that, um, I think that his wife, Tammy is supposed to have a, he, he was a voice told him, or he had a, he had a vision or something that, uh, Tammy, his wife would have a car accident. And then this, then I guess when that didn't happen, that, well, then they had that, that Alex was shooting at her and she didn't die that way. So, and then, then he had, that she died in her, he had a vision. She died in her sleep. And then and that came true because he's, you know, he's spirit stole them. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was kind of creepy too. Um, let's see. Uh, the psychologist, the chair and the chair. Okay. That was interviewed for 17 hours, but the only show, Oh my God. It showed five minutes. His assessment is on Hidden true crime for anyone who wants to, a decent psychologist talking about this case. Oh, real! Oh my God. Um, yeah, if, if you'll send me over, could could you send me over uh, a link to his that uh, is his name and a link? Um, I'd like to see it, and I'd like to. Uh, I think it's decent. I'll link it to this. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm. I, I, I wouldn't. You know, here's the thing about doing television, which is why sometimes I hate doing it because yeah, if if I did this show. And they'd ask me all these questions. I don't know how much of this would make it in there. I could just say something like, she's really pretty. And that would be what I'd say. And you go, well, that's that that profile is kind of dumb. All she said was that, is that Lori was pretty. <laughs> um, really don't know. Uh, television is a strange beast. Uh, and they, they call you. They want you to be on the show. You're on the show. You do your bit. You, they, they, they videotape you. And for like for an hour, two hours, how many hours? And that's unusually long hours for that. Um, usually it's like, I usually do one hour a show, sometimes two hours a show. Um, and then they edit the crap out of it and I get five minutes if I'm lucky. Um, and by the way, I did just do, I did at least, let's see. I think I did five shows for one production company and I did three shows for another production company. So there's eight shows out there that the production company did. And I don't know, I've never seen any of the shows and I don't even know where they are. I asked the production company what channel it was on and nobody will answer. So, so if you see me <laughs> talking about serial killers, uh, let me know because I haven't seen any of the shows that I, that I did. And I did them like a few number of months ago and I don't, maybe they haven't come out yet, but I have no idea what they are. 
So, but I talked about Danny Rowling was one of them. And then I talked, Rowling, 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 whatever his name is. I uh, did uh, David Berkowitz. Uh, I did a whole bunch of serial killers. And I don't remember what they are. Um, oh, okay. Judge Boyce is in charge of Chad and Lori's trials. Okay. I, I don't know what he's doing. Um, the judiciary and all the laws in each state are so different. Um, and I'm, I'm dealing with a trial right now um, with the one I was supposed to testify in for the prosecution that I'm not testifying for. Um, and I just saw the judge allowed something in there and I just rolled my eyes. I'm thinking, oh, my God, this judge looks like an idiot. You know, but I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this, the judge is following some legal precedent that I'm just not familiar with. So try to be fair about that. <laughs> um, the women around Chad remind me of Jim Jones. So glad you mentioned that. Still waiting for your Jim Jones analysis. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's a, there's a certain kind of type, you can say, of individual who tends to go to these things. Um, yeah, I, I do want to do a thing on Jim Jones, but I have a book, and it's a, it's a rare book, and it had the most interesting things about Jim Jones and another particular person that was in the FBI um, who uh, was hooked up on CIA. It's, it's, a comp, it's a complicated mess. But it was this one book, it just had some fascinating details, which some of it I know is absolutely true because I worked on another case that was related to the guy that knew Jim Jones. Anyway, um, can't find the book. I moved and I'm searching high and low for the stupid book. And I didn't want to do the show until I found the book. So that's my excuse for not getting it done <laughs> yet. But I will do one on Jim Jones. There's no question about it. Um, okay, more like L. Ron Hubbard than David Icke. Oh, uh, okay. Interesting. I mean, I, I, you know, I've forgotten what, yeah, I would, I would, I would say that may be true. Yeah. I'm sure, no, he, I'm sure he had his, um, his, uh, you know, he probably identified with certain things. They were like his mentors in his mind, you know, he's seen things and there's nothing wrong with that again, because you see somebody who does something, you think I, I can add, I can do that. And that's not wrong. I mean, so, that he had, you know, maybe he, you know, here, so he's, he's in the Church of Latter-day Saints and he's like, I, I, a lot of the stuff I believe in, but some of the stuff I just don't think is right. And now I've listened to Ron Hubbard, I'll listen to whatever. And I think that if I focus more on what, you know, that I might come up with a, a better answer. And he starts out that way and then it just, you know, maybe, you know, I say his uh, narcissism gets a hold of him and he has grandiose thinking and he just, you know, starts building in his head ideas that are, you know, ideas. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mary says, thanks for the show. I'm not so confused now. It, but I uh, do not blame you. I, I, I mean, trying to do the show after, after I saw Netflix and read all the stuff and read the book, I'm sitting here going, I don't know how I'm going to explain this. You know, I just don't know because I'm not just doing a historical thing. And I'm like, it's just such a hot mess. Thank you, Sarah Crime. Hot mess. Oof. Okay. Oh, here's his name. Okay. Dr. John Mathias on Hidden True Crime is Great. Dr. John, he's a prison psychologist. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, wait, but wait. So I don't so I don't have to go back and look for this on my show. I'm gonna do this. <laughs> um I'll have to check. I do not know of Dr. John Mathias. Um you uh and that I'm gonna I'm curious about him because maybe because he's a prison psychologist. You all know that I'm I'm absolutely a, a, a fan of Dr. Stanton Samenow, who was a prison psychologist um, over at um, a Saint Elizabeth Hospital in D.C. and he's written in uh, the Criminal Mind um, inside the Criminal Mind and uh, he, anything he writes is fabulous. And he started out being fooled by a lot of psychopaths until he realized, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm being taken advantage of here. They're like they're, they're they're just playing with me, and so he's one of the few psychologists I think is right on the money. And he and he he knows the truth. He understands psychopathy, and I and I think sometimes more therapeutic psychologists who are outside the system haven't had the experience, and they're always trying to help someone and trying to find a way to help them and giving them benefit of the doubt and and trying to put them in one of those. No, other labels, you know, which is some kind of disorder, you know, that you can work with. 
And I think they're just too soft hearted. Um, I think Dr. Granny is a little too soft hearted sometimes. I just think he comes from a therapeutic end where so I'm going to check out this guy. I'm curious to see whether I, he might be a, a new person that, because, you know, I like to promote anybody who's good at what they do and that I think is more of a down to earth realistic person, especially about criminals and, and psychopathy. So I'm going to check that out. Thank you for that. That's awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, Pat, for a great show. Have a great evening, all. Thank you. And I'm glad you were here, Anne. Oh, thank you, Lisa. I love how clear you are in your profiling. I try to be, I, I, you know, I think things should make sense. And of course, this is, this is my opinion. Um, you know, I, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and I try to look at the world as it is and, and people, how we all, you know, struggle in this world trying to do things. But then I you know there's, unfortunately, somewhere along the way, our world is a tough place and a lot of people's lives get derailed um, early on. And we don't know why people are psychopaths, why they become psychopaths, why they make the horrifying choices that they do, but they do. Um, that's why we have so much, you know, so many horrible things that do happen in the world, uh, rapes and murders and wars and stuff. And, you know, the only thing I can say is the thing that balances it out is that we have people who are so kind and good and decent, too. Then you go, wow, you know, in spite of all the horrible things, people still still want to love and still want to care for children and care for the elderly and, and do good things for their neighbors and that kind of thing. And, you know, putting politics and all the religion aside, people, you know, Generally speaking, you know, most people are pretty nice, you know, and regardless of uh, what their what their ideations are, they're usually nice until you run into that one. <laughs> In which case, if you married her, sorry for you. <laughs> You're so screwed you know, because she's that. I think she's that. Uh, I don't think she's delusional. I think she's a black widow. Uh, and she, you know, not all black widows have to kill their husbands, but they can still tie them up in their little web and extract everything out of them that they want until they drain them of everything and they die on their own, you know, so you know, still pretty evil. So anyway, that, that'll be my show for today. I thought it was absolutely a fascinating. Uh, I, you know, I'd known a little bit about this case, but actually spending more time on it and reading about, you know, so much about her and about all the different events. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what the trial is going to end up being, but, you know, I just wonder, you know, I think, I think she's going to come out better than Chad. That's just my theory. <laughs> I don't know that that's true, but that's my theory. <laughs> You're welcome, Florence. And thank you for all for being here. It was fun to have you here. And uh, I will, I will see you. Oh, oh there's Molly. Uh, <laughs> Molly says, thanks, Pat, for shedding light on this hot mess. What do you think might confuse the jury? Okay, before I go, I'll answer that, Molly. Well, you know me and my dislike of the civilian jury system. Um, what, once you get somebody in a courtroom and you get the defense attorney saying this and that, the, the way it can get twisted, the way they can present things. I mean, it, here's another game. This is another game. And a lot of <laughs> they're going to delude, <laughs> delude people into thinking something may not even be true. And that's the defense's. Uh, a purpose and sometimes the prosecution's purpose uh, because I've been having a uh, some <clears throat> some commentary on my thing on the Adnan Adnan Syed case that is now being reopened uh, suppose he's Adnan Syed who was convicted for killing Heyman Lee in uh, Baltimore Maryland uh, quite a quite a while ago uh, a couple of decades now anyway um, uh, Marilyn Mosby she's the prosecutor for a uh, the state's attorney sorry state's attorney for for Baltimore County um, Baltimore County or city, whatever it is. But anyway, she just asked for this uh, to is, is um, uh, conviction to be set aside and get a new. She wants a new trial for him. And people who watch Serial and Undisclosed, Undisclosed is that the next the one his lawyer did. Um, they are just ecstatic. Finally, Adnan's getting the, a fair shake. She, he's going to get a new trial. This is amazing and wonderful. Well, first of all, Mosby is under indictment um, because she's a crook. And I think she's just pulling this. In other words, he never got an appeal. He his appeals all failed, but she's ignoring the appeal system. And she is jumping in and just basically a lot, going around and you know doing whatever little sneaky way she can do it. I think she wants attention. I think she 
she believes that if this goes back to trial, Adnan will be found not guilty. Why is that? Um, because you get a new civilian jury in there and you get the defense attorney and they have been so, there's so much media on this case. Nobody's going to dare find him guilty. I don't think that jury will say, oh my God, there's too much that makes me question his guilt. And so the defense attorney can come in and just throw a whole bunch of stuff around. They'll find him not guilty. Adnan will go free and Mosby will get her day in the sun. She might be a psychopath, but anyway, I don't like the woman. Okay, so um, so when this jury comes in, now we got a lot of stuff that says that's pretty pretty good stuff against Lori and Chad. But by the time it gets there, and by the time the sympathy thing starts, the defense is going to work on sympathy, sympathy, sympathy. This poor woman has been brutalized by. Four husbands and, oh, five husbands, because we're going to include Chad, right? I mean, her first husband beat her. Her second husband beat her. Her third husband ab abused her ch and raped her children. Her fourth husband beat her and did all kinds of weird things and tried to steal her children. Uh, and the fifth husband, he was a cult leader and sucked her into the cult because she was such a, she was so vulnerable at that point, so open to any kind of love and hope that she fell for everything Chad said. And therefore, she started, he, he made her believe that her children were evil and that they were dark spirits that are going to destroy even more of her world. Her world had already been destroyed so many times, but now her children are going to destroy her world too. She started believing this stuff. That's where they're going to go with this. And you get a jury in there who goes, oh, the poor woman. My God, she had some really tough times. I don't know. That's the problem. You know, it's it's a crapshoot because you're not looking at a professional jury who can look at the stuff and not have a whole bunch of emotions involved. Uh, I think that's that's a problem. Um, oh, OK, I will do that. Uh, Carrie, would you consider a follow up after the court proceedings? Then? Yeah, I'll do I'll do a follow up on the uh, on the on the. Uh, whether they're found guilty or not guilty. Um, what, now, what's going to be interesting? See, this is one of the problems with appeal system and. and I mean, we need an appeal system of some sort. But one of the things that happens, and we see this with the Adnan Syed case, we see this with many cases um, where you, they appeal once, they appeal twice, they, and then 10 years goes by. And by the time they appeal the third time, they've dug up something that can, they can convince somebody of, some judge that, oh, you know, some suspicious here, and we'll give them a new trial. Well, you know, the problem is over 10 years, you can always dig up something that's just confusing, you know, and... And when 10 years goes by, people forget how it felt at the time, the, 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 the newness of the case. It becomes something that they have the poor, pitiful person in prison all those years. And just maybe they've been in there and they didn't deserve to be. So why can't you give them another trial? You know, what's wrong with them? This People say this with Adnan Syed. Why, Pat, do you think he shouldn't have another trial? You know, if he's guilty, they'll find him guilty. No, that's not the way it works. He's finally getting another trial, which is rolling the dice again and seeing if you can get a different jury to fall for the defense. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. Now, the problem is sometimes somebody is wrongly convicted. That's true. And therefore, you have to have some kind of appeal system that gives them a chance to prove that they were wrongly convicted and they deserve to get another trial. But if we had, I think, more of a professional jury system, we wouldn't be so much throwing the dice as much because there'd be more understanding that theoretically the professionals professional jurors, if you had five professional jurors like myself and a you no know, other trained jurists, that they wouldn't fall for this stuff because they're doing case after case and they've, they're, you know, they understand crime scene analysis and profiling and psycho psychology and, and evidence and DNA and all that kind of crap. And they're not, you can't snow them as easily. I think the trials will be way shorter. I think you would have not this ridiculous lying experts on the stand. You wouldn't have the emotional things thrown out because the professional jury is going to go, stop this. <laughs> you know, you're boring the hell out of us. We know this is garbage. So, you know, I think that you would have a whole different scenario of how the, you would have shorter trials, more logical trials. And then if, you know, so I don't know. Um, I'd like to see the whole system change, but I haven't seen anybody work to do anything about it. Uh, they just keep going on and saying, this is a great system and I think it sucks. So... <laughs> That's what I think. Um, so, yeah, I'll do a follow up. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. And but I think they're going to go for the sob story on on Lori. That's my theory, because if I were if I were a lawyer who didn't have ethics, which I think a lot of defense lawyers don't. Sorry, defense lawyers. Um, uh, 
I would do anything I could to snow that jury. I surely would. And the way I'd snow them is to make her a victim. That's what I would do. And I'm sure that's what's going to happen. So it'll be interesting. And I think one, as I, it'll be interesting to see if Chad turns on her or she turns on Chad or they just turn on each other. Because <laughs> they're never going to be a get together again. You know what I mean? And besides which, once she's in jail, she's cuter than Chad. So she can probably get tons and tons. She can get a fan club and all that stuff. And then she'll get, you know, she got a new, she'll get lots, lots of attention. She'll, she'll probably be okay. Even in prison, she'll have fun. So that's, that's the way it works. So anyway, I'll see you next time. Again, if you're new to the channel and still here, do like and subscribe and join Patreon if you'd like to be in the chat room with all our wonderful patrons. It's been great being here with you. See you next time.